and 16. Agenda item number one is a decision um, as to whether we take uh, business in private. And members agree that we take item six, consideration of our work programme in private. Thank you for that. Item agenda number two is subordinate legislation and a frequent visitor to the committee. <laughs> Again, I welcome Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, to speak on to an affirmative SSI, the Home Detention Curfew Licence Amendment Scotland Order 2016 draft. Uh, and accompanying the Minister are Quinton Fisher and Susan Bullock, both from Community Justice Division, and Craig McGuffey from the Director of Legal Services, both uh, all welcome again. I remind ministers that officials are, permi are permitted to give evidence under this item, but not participate in the formal debate on instruments under item three in the agenda. Minister, do you want to make an opening statement? Thank you. So I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak uh, briefly to this SSI uh, this morning. The Home Detention Curfew Licence Amendment Scotland Order 2016 amends Section 3AA Subsection 5 of the Prisoners and Criminal Proceedings Scotland Act 1993. It does this by repealing paragraphs F and G of that section, which in turn refer to Section 16 and 17 of that 1993 Act. Section 3AA Subsection 5 uh, provides a list of circumstances where the Scottish Minister's power to release a prisoner from prison under Section 3AA Subsection 1, which is known as Home Detention Curfew or HDC. So this uh, provides a list where the uh, uh, possible discretion of Scottish Ministers does not apply. Uh, HDC is a form of release from prison for up to six months prior to the halfway stage of the prisoner's sentence. During this period, the prisoner is tagged and subject to a curfew condition which is remotely monitored. Paragraph F, uh, which we seek by this SSI to uh, uh, remove, uh, permanently prevents HDC being granted to a prisoner where the prisoner has previously been released in licence, but has then been recalled to prison for either non-compliance with their licence conditions or their having received a further sentence of imprisonment before the expiry of their sentence. Paragraph G permanently prevents HDC being granted to a prisoner where the prisoner has previously been released from prison during the term of their sentence, but has then been returned to custody during that time for committing a further offence. The repeal of these paragraphs will mean that these prisoners may be able to obtain HDC. Their release, however, will still be at the discretion of Scottish ministers exercised, in fact, via the Scottish Prison Service. HDC is not guaranteed in deciding whether to grant HDC, the Scottish ministers via the Scottish Prison Service are obliged to carry out a stringent risk assessment and to take account of the need to protect the public. The repeal of these paragraphs implements one of the recommendations made in October of this year by the Electronic Monitoring in Scotland Working Group. This consisted of experts from the prison service and the police as well as independent researchers, social work practitioners, and a representative of Scottish Women's Aid. In making this recommendation, the working group pointed to the fact that permanently excluding low-risk prisoners from applying for HDC does not recognise an individual's progress in terms of rehabilitation and improvements in compliance and motivation to desist from offending. Uh, indeed, the working group considered that the fact that someone was recalled at 18 uh, years of age for breaching their HDC licence should not preclude them for, uh, from applying for it at a later stage of their lives. Uh, finally, it should be noted that a number of exclusions from HDC will uh, indeed remain. Uh, these include uh, life prisoners, uh, sexual and violent offenders uh, who are serving an extended sentence imposed under Section 21A of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, as well as sex offenders who are subject to the notification requirements of Part 2 of the Sexual Offences Act uh, 2003. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, convener. Are there questions for the Minister? D Douglas Ross and Mary Fee. Thank you, Convener. Can I ask the Minister, does she expect, if this is granted, to use the uh, powers extensively or sparingly? Well, the, the 
the position with regard to any decisions are made uh, on, in terms of the Scottish Government Ministers, as I said, via the Scottish Prison Service. So, for example, uh, if uh, there was a long-term prisoner involved, this would only uh, apply in the first instance if uh, the parole uh, board made a recommendation uh, for release at the halfway stage. So these decisions are decisions that are made uh, by the practitioners on the ground uh, and it would be a matter to look at each individual case as to, as to what happened in those circumstances. If I can press, you're asking this committee to recommend to this parliament to give Scottish Government Ministers more powers and I'm just wondering, do you anticipate using them a lot, a little or not much? I was saying to the member that the exercise of the powers is, uh, whilst uh, in statute discretion of Scottish ministers, in practice that is the Scottish Prison Service, but at the moment, in terms of the figures we have, uh, it would appear that there would only be 300 prisoners who could possibly fall within these uh, categories that I've mentioned. Can I ask uh, the statistics that back up this recommendation in the, uh, the report? which came to this conclusion. Where are those statistics? It says on page 50 of the report, the group therefore recommended that section 16 and 17 statutory exclusions are removed and will include statistics as evidence in the final report. But that comment is from the Scottish Government's own final report. So I'm unsure where those statistics ended up. Report, are you referring to the Electronic Monitoring Scotland Working Group final report? Yes. Final report. Yes, yeah. yeah. report uh, of, of which, of course, was drawn up by those who sat on the working group, which, as I said, comprised uh, a number of, of uh, organisations, including uh, the police, prison service, social work, violence reduction unit, uh, Scottish Women's Aid, uh, G4S monitoring. So Sorry, these were the people. These were the people that produced the report, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Rossi. But, but the report states on page 50 that the statistics behind this recommendation will be included in the final report, yet they're not. So where are they? Uh, well, I would ask officials to clarify that position. I don't know if there's further, a further annex that is required to go along with this report. There's no further annex as far as I'm aware. Um, we can follow up on that and, and, yeah. and let you know if you wish. Not quite an omission, though, for you know, a minister and government officials to come to this committee asking us to support this instrument and referring to a report that says the statistics are in the report when they're not? Well, I, I apologise if there's a reference to something that's not added to the report, but I would say that this was a report drawn up by this expert working group uh, comprising all the members uh, that I've cited. Uh, and I, I would imagine the, ministers, the members are not trying to suggest that uh, they're, they're, they're basing their recommendations on, on evidence that they what don't regard suggest, as robust and satisfactory. Suggest, if I can, Minister, what I'm trying to suggest is those experts felt it was important enough to write in the report that the statistics will be included in the final report, yet that said in the Scottish Government's own final report, and there's no mention of the statistics, which back up, apparently, the proposal you're putting forward to this committee and to Parliament. Well, the proposal that we're putting forward in terms of the SSI follows on directly from recommendation number seven of this expert working group, whose uh, membership I have uh, referred to. And I think it's all members would statistics. accept that membership is independent and, uh -huh. and if comprehensive. If I could perhaps just intervene here, Minister. Um, it, it is important evidence in looking at this whole SSI, and I would reasonably expect it to have been looked at in the first instance by yourself and your officials and to come to this committee prepared with that information. Well, I, with respect, I have come prepared having read in detail the, the Electronic Monitoring Scotland Working Group report, and if there was a, 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 an addendum in terms of any stats looked at, then we'd be happy to provide that to the committee whether on page 50 or any other page. But uh, what I'm saying, convener, is that this, uh, the SSI that we're proposing uh, and putting before the committee today uh, takes up directly recommendation seven, uh, one element thereof proposed by this expert working group who have been uh, uh, considering their work, I think, since 2014. So over a period of some 16 months, there has been, uh, I think there was a, a national conference comprising some 100, 150 uh, experts working in uh, the uh, criminal justice sphere uh, and there have been, I think, some 12 national events. So all this work has built, been built on together, uh, which has culminated in these experts, these representatives from a comprehensive section of the criminal justice fraternity in Scotland uh, producing these recommendations, one of which we are proposing to take up in the SSI before the committee today. 
Minister, I would expect you to attend this committee with these um, uh, statistics here for the committee to see now when we're considering it. It has been referred to by the working group. Douglas Ross. C could I ask for more information on the 300 uh, potential people who would be subject to this uh, removal of the conditions? What sentences are they currently serving? What offences are they serving sentences for? Well, there'll be a mixture. There'll be a mixture of sentences. But of course, as I've said, and I think it's very important, if I could maybe exemptions. just answer the question, as I've said also, it would be important to restate, I think, uh, uh, for the committee's benefit and for those listening, that the, a number of key exclusions, of course, will remain from the HDC system uh, today as they will tomorrow if the committee uh, sees fit to approve the SSI. Uh, so those include life prisoners, those include sex offenders uh, or violent prisoners who have an extended sentence, and those include sex offenders who are subject to a notification requirements. I think it's very important to restate that those will remain exclusions ab initio from the HDC uh, system. And as for any other potential uh, prisoners to whom this would refer, there will be a whole cross-section and also it, it will be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. So uh, I, I hope that answer is helpful for the member. Well, no, because you'd earlier told me which ones were not included in this, which I fully understand. What, you know, I basically want to get on record. It's a range of issues, a range of offences which affect communities, individuals, etc., etc., who will, if this is agreed, see these people released into the community, which for the last decade they've not been released back into the community eh, on a home detention curfew. The people who will be that this uh, SSI is designed to, to deal with are those who committed a breach on licence and those, in effect, those who committed a breach on licence and of conditions uh, of licence conditions whilst on licence, uh, and those who committed an, another offence whilst on a community sentence. So those are the categories uh, of of prisoner who would be eligible for consideration, but it's by no means an automatic grant and it is dealt with uh, on a case-by-case -case basis and it is subject to a very stringent risk assessment uh, uh, which of course includes uh, above all the interests of public safety. So those uh, conditions pertain uh, uh, as today as they will tomorrow uh, and the, the, the key exclusions will remain of course in place. Ultimately, you're saying up to 300 people, potentially based on your figures, could be released. And the reasoning behind it is to give them hope, uh, where they haven't had hope to, to get that detention curfew in the future. But therefore, there could be a negative impact on the communities who see people who are serving community sentences, etc., who commit crimes while they are doing community sentences, almost getting, uh, you know, not having a further deterrent from doing these crimes and offences because they know this exemption will now be taken away from them and they would still be um, liable or, or still be acceptable for them to be put forward for a home detention curfew when that wasn't the case. And I worry about the negative message that sends to our communities who are already suspicious about some of the efficiency and effectiveness of some of the community sentencing. Well, I mean, uh, that bring, brings in a wider consideration of, of, I think, the HDC approach uh, as one of, of various uh, strands of approach in terms of community justice. Um, HDC, I think, from memory, has been going since around 2006, uh, and it has applied to certain categories of prisoner. This uh, uh, SSI today would seek, as I say, to bring within the possible grant, but not the automatic grant, of HDC uh, those who have committed a breach while on licence and those who have committed a crime whilst in uh, serving a community justice sentence. Uh, and I think as the point has been made uh, by practitioners in the field, to take an example of a, an 18-year-old man, a male, who has breached a condition in licence and some years down the line finds themselves uh, before the, the, the criminal justice system, uh, the question I suppose that needs to be asked, a fundamental question, is should that person be excluded from uh, the possibility of uh, an HDC which is seen as being uh, uh, useful in uh, furthering rehabilitation, furthering reintegration into the community and reducing, thereby reoffending, which I think everybody wants to see. Uh, and this is seen as a, as a useful tool in that regard. So, uh, but as I say, always with the stringent risk assessment that would be uh, applied on a case-by-case -case basis with public safety uh, at the very heart of the process. Followed by John Finney. Um, convener, I wonder, Minister, if, if you could give us any indication of, in practice, what level of oversight ministers would have when making this decision. Would they simply be acting on recommendations that, that were made, or will the ministers be the one that will be doing the recommending and in detail looking at each individual case? 
Well, uh, the, the actual position is, although it is in statute a Scottish Minister's uh, uh, decision, it is in fact exercised through the uh, agency of the Scottish Prison Service, uh, and perhaps a community justice official would like to give an example of how that uh, process then would work. Yeah. Um, on an individual basis. On an individual basis, once they've served the quarter stage of their sentence, uh, the Scottish Prison Service would ask criminal justice social work for a home assessment. That report would include um, circumstances about the home address that they're going to go back to, who lives in that address, are these people happy that the prisoner is released back into that address. Um, that would go back to prison service, who would consider that, along with the risk of the public safety, um, the risks that might be posed, and if they're happy there's, the person can be released, um, they'll be released on a tag um, to serve the last quarter of the imprisonment service in the community. And maybe I could add to my understanding as well, just in terms of the practicalities, is that um, so the tag is it can be a curfew of 12 hours, for example, that any uh, breach is uh, the, the compliance, the, the monitoring of compliance on the part of the operator of the service is uh, very rigorous and is 24 7, and any breach it can be immediately seen. Uh, so that is why, for example, uh, I mentioned that Scottish Women's Aid sit, sat on this uh, expert working group. They do see, going forward, the opportunities uh, for electronic tagging of, of whatever kind as a, a means of actual, uh, actually better uh, control in terms of where they think the perpetrator might be, so having exclusion zones and so forth. So uh, that is uh, further work that is in scope at the moment. Uh, and. Uh, uh, has been uh, has been seen as having benefits, in fact. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for the explanation. It doesn't quite answer the question that I posed, which is if someone is out on licence and a, a breach occurs, and at a later stage, the ministers have the opportunity to recommend that they are released again on, on a home detention curfew. The point I'm trying to get at is that the ministers actually make the decision, or do they endorse a decision that's made somewhere else? Well, it is the, 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 the SPAS, the Scottish Prison Service, that, uh, uh, that make the decision uh, in terms of there being an agency in that regard for the, the Scottish Ministers. And what, what guidance and criteria will, will be applied to allow Ministers to then overturn? Do you see any instances where you may overturn a decision that's made in relation to these specific 300 prisoners? Um, I would ask the legal department. I don't think Ministers have a... The decision taken by the Scottish Prison Service would be the, the decision of the Scottish Ministers. The, the Scottish Prison Service are an executive agency of the, the Scottish Ministers, so their, their decision as it stands as the decision of the Scottish Ministers. So it, it wouldn't be a case of the Scottish Ministers overturning it. That may happen at an administrative level before the decision is taken. Um, if a decision is intimated to the Justice Directorate up at Sandra's House by SPS, th there may be some involvement of, of for example, the, the Cabinet Secretary might say, that there's a certain prisoner who's going to apply for HDC, I, I don't want to let out, it's, it could be a high profile prisoner or whatever, but um, the decision is ultimately taken by SPS headquarters. It says in this paper, ministers will have discretion to release those prisoners from prison on home detention. It's not actually ministers, it's the Scottish Prison Service. As ministers, it's just it's the decision is taken th uh, through delegated authority um, by the Scottish Prison okay. Service. And, and the example you gave, Minister, of the 18 year old male that commits a crime and then later in life commits a crime and currently is excluded. Um, and if this SSI is granted, will no longer be excluded. Will offenders have the opportunity to apply once or can they apply to ministers for the discretion to be released on home detention curfew once and then five years later, if they're in prison again, do the same thing again? How many opportunities will they have to do this? I think it works in the other way around, but going back to Susan's point about how the assessment is made as to who would be eligible, it's for those who, who are considered short-term or automatic if they're long-term, it's a decision of the parole board that they can be released halfway through their sentence, and then it, this kicks in six months prior to that. So I, I'm not entirely sure it would be the prisoner that would apply, rather it would be the, the, the criminal justice uh, criminal services justice, yes. that uh, you know, may start the, the process where they feel it may be appropriate. Made on more than once for one individual. Um, if they were someone that, that offended regularly, could, could that application be made more than once for one person? Yes. The, 
HDC is, is taken in the six months up to the halfway stage of the sentence, so there's only a very short window that the, the prisoner can apply for it. Um, generally, if, if it's refused once, it's only to be considered again for that for that sentence. But in future sentences, that the prisoner could apply I, again. I don't, I don't know how the application process works, whether it's the prisoner kickstarts it or the the uh, residential manager in the prison um, or whatever. But the 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 grant can take place once in that sentence. Um, so, and, and in this case, uh, if somebody has been recalled from licence for a previous sentence, um, these amendments will, will mean that they, they could then apply in future sentences. And if, if they're sentenced three, four, five times in the future, they could apply each and every time. The, okay. the, the information that, the, that can be considered by ministers would include that previous release, release on licence and that previous recall, um, and that could count against that, that, that prisoner in the Scottish Minister's consideration of the, de the decision. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, of course statistics are important, but it's the individual that matters here and the individual prisoner that matters. Now, you've said that there's certain categories that will be excluded, and it would seem to me that we're a danger of cutting off our nose to spite our face if we exclude the group. I'm very supportive of this, this direction of travel. Can you confirm that in addition to the comprehensive risk assessment at the time the recommendation is made for the individual, there's an ongoing risk assessment, including the community impact? If you, if you mean in terms of ones the if, if a decision to, to grant has been made, yes. Um, well, yes. I mean, there's there's a, there's a, a comply, compliance by the service operator on a 24/7 basis, uh, and if it is a long-term prisoner, uh, there will also be supervision by the criminal justice social work uh, as well. So the, there is ongoing monitoring, and the possibility to revoke can be done immediately, and immediately can be immediate uh, if there's a breach of, of compliance. So. There is a very robust system, uh, and I think uh, the statistics, although statistics we can see have different elements to them, but I understand that in the first six months of this year that some 90% of HDCs granted have met with success in the sense that there's not been a breach uh, in those circumstances. So I think that's quite a high, high figure. Okay, I mean, also the question of support, because um, it isn't automatically going to be the case that the resource that would have meant this individual would have been retained in, in prison is going to be transferred to the community. Are you content that there's sufficient resource in the community to address this? Uh, yes, but I, uh, one of the, um, the elements of the expert group's uh, uh, report was to, to raise issues of wider support as we go forward look forward to the opportunities that further electronic uh, tagging monitoring present and that's a very important element that the member raises that that would have to be considered very carefully as we uh, uh, consider uh, further opportunities along these lines so support is very important because we've got to make this work uh, and it's to work also of course uh, for victims and that is very very important indeed and we have been uh, working with victims organisations and will of course continue to do so uh, on these subjects. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Uh, I just want to ask a wee question about the monitoring technology and its development. Um, uh, and in the context, of course, that we, we know from extensive research that sentences served outside prison are much more successful in reducing reoffending than uh, people who spend a lot of time in prison, albeit the... the the categories of prisoners may be slightly different. But I just wanted to ask a general question as to whether the technology that's used to monitor HDCs is continued to improve and therefore it's a more effective way of keeping track of people who are serving sentences out with prison. Uh, well, I'm not the, an expert in technology. I imagine like all technologies, we go in a very exponential curve uh, in terms of improvement, but perhaps one of the officials could care to give some further information? Yes, certainly. Um, well, that was the technology currently used is, is radio frequency RF technology. Um, one of the recommendations of the working group was that, um, th that steps be taken to actually introduce new technologies, of course, GPS being the obvious one. Um, in order to do that, however, um, we are going to have to, to legislate and, and legislate in prim change primary legislation um, um, to introduce the GPS technology. So that's all ongoing work as far as we're concerned um, about taking that forward. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. I'm just, um, uh, thanks, Minister, for uh, attending. Um, I'm just wondering if the Minister thinks that the report and subsequent uh, decision and recommendation 
uh, that we have in front of us reflects ever growing body of evidence that, as Stuart Stevenson uh, touched on as well, that custody, apart from in the most serious cases, doesn't uh, lead to a reduction of reoffending, and whether this uh, decision will bring us into to line with other more progressive, if you like, uh, U uh, European nations. Yes, well, the, the report uh, refers to um, some international uh, com uh, comparison studies that have been made, uh, and I think work has gone on at Stirling University in particular, uh, and also uh, looking at Council of Europe uh, countries. And uh, I think it is correct to, to, to say that what the member suggests is right, that uh, for those who look at um, robust uh, 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 alternative options uh, in terms of community sentencing, robust, uh, that are properly monitored, uh, properly resourced, that of course exclude uh, the, the, the most violent and heinous uh, criminals, uh, then that uh, is uh, a, a way to uh, ensure that we make some progress in tackling uh, uh, community justice issues uh, and reoffending. Uh, and if we can uh, make progress in, in these ways, then we reduce reoffending, which presumably is, is the goal that everybody wishes to see, including for the individuals who are caught in this cycle uh, uh, themselves, uh, and certainly for communities who are blighted by it. So that is uh, certainly the direction of travel that we would hope to, to proceed with, absolutely. I wonder if you could clarify this discretion of the the minister, that, that sounds quite straightforward, yet your evidence seems to suggest, minister, that it would be at the discretion of the SPS and the, the minister would, would not overrule that. Is that the case? Well, it's, it's an exercise that the Scottish minister's discretion set forth in statute is exercised via the executive agency of the Scottish Prison Service um, and has been since uh, HDC was uh, brought to book, which was 2006. That has not changed. That is exactly the same today as it would be tomorrow. Well, did I misunderstand Mr McGuffey then when he said there may be a case where it's a known criminal and the, um, the minister may in these circumstances intervene? Ultimately, S SPS is an executive agency of the Scottish Minister, so the Scottish Minister still have some element of control. Um, whether that control would be welcomed by Mr McConnell, I don't know, but um, certainly if, if there was a, a, an issue where, uh, say for, for example, a high-profile prisoner wanted to get HTC, um, the Cabinet Secretary was aware of it and thought that, that, that this wasn't a good idea. The Cabinet Secretary could exert some influence over SPS, but ultimately the decision would be for SPS taken under delegated authority, and that decision would be the decision of the Scottish Ministers, SPS being an executive agency of the Scottish Ministers. Yeah, I, I suppose I'm a bit nervous of getting into the situation that we get into all too frequently with Police Scotland, where uh, any problems are always deferred to us an operation matter for the Police Scotland, and, and this sounds kind of similar to me. Minister, I'm going to ask you not to move this at this time. I would very much like to see the statistics which... Um, Quite reasonably, I think, the committee should have had them in front of them today. They were referred to in the working group, and um, I think for the full consideration of that, the committee should have the opportunity to see these before we move on it. Um, so, yeah, I would, if you're prepared I, not to move, well, then that would be Well, I would still quite helpful. like to move, because I, I do feel um, that, you know, this is a very detailed report. I don't know if every member has had the opportunity to read this report today, and it's a culmination of 16 months' work. Uh, and I guess if members had wished to proceed with individual researches beyond the report itself, they could have proceeded to do that. Uh, it is a report that is very comprehensive. The, the, the composition of the, uh, of the uh, expert group was very comprehensive across the criminal justice system uh, and included experts in their fields uh, of independence of minds. I'm not quite sure why we're uh, putting into question this report, convener into the question. You've come today and your officials have come to the, co the committee unprepared without um, statistics that are referred to in this report. I find that unacceptable and it's for that reason I'm asking you not to move this. Is there a time limit for this report? Well, I, I hear what you say, you know, I, and you know, I, I don't want to disrespect the office of, of the chair of the, this committee. I, I, I still feel... <laughs> that I, I, I do feel that in the circumstances I've just explained just one moment ago, 
uh, uh, that uh, beyond the report itself it would have been for members to, to pursue in their own time their individual researches, but I'm uh, uh, told by officials that it would not be a, a critical uh, uh, moment if the SSI did not get moved today. So on that basis, I'm prepared to uh, not move the SSI today. And if the, mem if the convener could clarify though what it is that the committee would be seeking, that would be very helpful uh, indeed. Could you do that? It's the statistics, uh, statistics referred to uh, during this discussion. I'm grateful for the Minister for the confirmation that she doesn't intend to move today. With that now, we move on to... Uh, Ah, yes. Uh, can I thank the Minister and officials for attending today? All right, move on to agenda item four. Agenda item four um, is supporting the legislation. The fourth item um, is two negative SSIs. The first is Community Justice Outcome Improvement Plan and Performance Report Scotland Regulations 2016 SSI. 21016, oblique 309, and Act of Sedernt, fees of solicitors and shorthand writers in the Court of Session, Sheriff Appeal Court and Sheriff Court Amendment 2016, SSI 2016, oblique 316. And I refer members to paper number two. And in particular, I refer members to the SPICE briefing on um, the Act of Sederant, um, it particularly page two. And um, I'm going to take the liberty of reading exactly what that says because it does refer to a previous recommendation, a very strong recommendation from a previous Justice Committee, which was as follow. The committee seeks assurances there will not be a substantial rise in the level of court fees to pay for the reforms in the bill and will monitor closely the outcome of the next consultation on fees in 2015 and consequently statutory orders. So with that, I invite members, uh, comments from members. I remind members that this um, SSI proposes a 24% increase in court fees. And it was very much the, the opinion of the last Justice Committee that there should not be a substantial rise in the level of court fees to pay for the reforms in the bill. Any comments? John Finney. Um, I'm more consider concerned with the actual figures rather than the percentage figures. We're talking about £18 there. The reassurance I take is that those on low incomes are exempted. Um, the regime covers those on, and again, quoting, that's quoting from the SPICE briefing, the current exemption regime covers those on income-based social security benefits such as income support, and those in receipt of civil legal aid exempted from court fees. Um, uh, that it's notionally available to those with disposable incomes of up to 20,000. However, there is a caveat with that. So I'm relaxed about the proposal, I have to say. Any other comments? Douglas Roth? Is it possible, I, I don't know how this works, to get more information on some of the comments that were previously made? I mean, we were told um, that uh, two years ago, I think the Scottish Government said uh, it would take some time to get to full cost recovery, yet just two years later they're, they're saying they're there. They also state that the Scottish Government has indicated that it intends to look at fees again in 2018. At this stage, it is hoped to have better data. So does that mean that they're proposing this with poor data, if you look at the negative to that statement? Yeah, fair point. Any other comments? Stuart Stevenson, Mary Fee. Uh, it's convenient. It's part of a 10-year programme that started in 2006 yeah. to uh, uh, recover the full costs, and it's appropriate that we proceed with this at this stage. Yeah, I would agree with the comments that have been made by um, both John Finney and, and Stuart Stevenson. I mean, the paper quite clearly says court fees are a small part of the cost of, 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 of taking action, and, and I think... Um, I'm inclined to, to, to look at the, the figures rather than the percentage, and I think that's the sensible way to go ahead, and I, I, I wouldn't want to hold this up in any way. Well, I think we've... Uh, Liam, Liam? I, I mean, as a 
not familiar with the, the, the background um, to this, although I, I think John is right to, to um, pick out some of the uh, the safeguards that are in the, the system. I mean, it, it would be helpful, I think, to, to understand what that trajectory is, is if, as Stuart says, there's a process been ongoing from 2006. I'm not clear why any undertaking would have been given to a previous committee that the direction of travel wouldn't have continued along the path that this appears to be part of. Um, but I, I, I think the point made about the overall levels of fees um, and, and, and the safeguards that are in place, I think, offers at least some, some reassurance. But as I say, I'm, I'm at a disadvantage in not, not knowing what the, uh, the earlier undertakings um, were that ministers uh, appear to have given to the committee. I think the, the principle was access to justice and that um, that should remain in looking at court fees. There shouldn't be a substantial increase. I take on board John Finney's point um, that it is relatively small in monetary terms. There is an important principle that's been laid down today. And if it's the will of the committee, and it certainly seems to be, to approve the SSI, then um, I'm so minded to, to move that we do that. Any other comments? No. Right. Um, are the committee agreed, therefore, it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to either of these instruments? Agreed. 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 Okay. And just suspend. Yeah. Suspend briefly to allow witnesses to take their seats. Pleasure to welcome the first of today's panel of witnesses. This is the committee's third uh, week of taking evidence in the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service inquiry. So I welcome to the committee today Chief Superintendent, in, Superintendent Gordon Crossan, President of the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents, Rachel Weir, Vice President and Fiona Eady, Secretary of the Procurator Fiscal Society section of the FTA, and Stephen Murray, Branch Executive Committee Member of PCS Scotland, and Callum Steele, of the General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation. I refer members to Paper 2, which is a note by the clerks, and Paper 4, which is a private paper. Um, all witnesses have provided written evidence and I'm very great, grateful to them for doing that. And I now invite questions from members. Stuart Stevenson, John Finney. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Convener. Sorry. Apologies, can I just uh, declare an interest before we start, if that's possible? Yes, um, I, my partner uh, works for uh, the Victim Information Advice Service within the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. So in the interest of transparency, I would just like to declare that. I have previously declared that. Um, my written evidence that I've submitted and any evidence that I provide today is solely the, the information given from my members. Uh, right, thank, thank you, convener. I think... Um, one of the threads that's come through the evidence the committee has taken so far and is repeated in the written evidence we have in front of us today uh, relates to the operation of the centralised marking system that is, is now used by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And I, I, I haven't yet got a sense of the overall effect of that in terms of efficiency. I get the sense that it may well be that it has made the marking process a more efficient, less resource-intensive activity, but 
that the effects on other parts of the service may more than overbalance that and increase the overall effort. That, I, I'm not saying that because I've directly been told that at this stage, and I just want to get the sense of the, the panel as to whether that suggestion on my part is one that they would agree with, or could they lead me to the path of salvation and, uh, and tell me that actually the centralized system, the savings there are not offset by costs of effort and time elsewhere in the system. I think that would be a good place to start today for me. And I'd be happy to hear from everyone, I suspect, unless <laughs> anyone wants to demit. You choose. Do you need it, Rachel? I'll start. Rachel. Um, I think there are always advantages and disadvantages in any system. Uh, the principal advantages in centralising um, are undoubtedly to bring together a core of specialist experience with routine marking. There's some anecdotal evidence within our organisation that when you are repeating the same task um, over a period of time, then you build up a degree of expertise and that in turn builds up a degree of efficiency in terms of processes. Um, it is early days for that team. It was only recently introduced. There is some work being done in relation to it at the moment, which um, I think the committee members have already heard from the department in respect of. Um, but I think my, my position in relation to it would be that there are advantages and disadvantages to it. Um, the advantages in many ways outweigh it but it's important that we keep it under review and we keep evaluating what's working within the organisation and what's not working. And that's one of the things that we do very closely with the department in our discussions with them from the trade union perspective. Before we move on to others, I wonder, you, you said it's a balance of advantage and disadvantage, but you only referred to the advantages. Could you give me a sense of your view of the disadvantages where the other activities might be affected? If I could look less to my own view and our organisational view to um, the evidence that the committee members have had in writing from a number of organisations which have pointed to concerns about local and loss of local relationships, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think the local relationships still exist. I think there are ways for that local information and local input as to the impact of certain crimes on communities to be relayed to a national <coughs> unit. After all, Scotland is only a, a people of six million. It is not the largest country in the world and it shouldn't be beyond our gift to be able to share that inf excuse me, information. I think the challenge um, is in reassuring communities locally that we're able to do so. And that's one of the things that our members are very much focused on. But that does become somewhat harder when you have a national unit located in two specific locations because they can't be everywhere at once. Others? Yes, yeah, thank you, Convener. I think to some extent the, the advantages have yet to be realised. I think the I think it's conceptually easy enough to understand why the advantages would exist. Uh, but the, 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 the biggest challenge in, invariably from uh, from the members that I represent perspective is the ability to get access to local fiscals uh, and have access to them uh, and, and, and get uh, information from them f uh, on cases that are marked elsewhere. Uh, and that invariably co causes difficulty, delay and, um, and problems. And anything that adds additional time into the criminal justice system uh, is, is problematic. Um, I, I actually think that us with much that is discussed in the criminal justice arena, looking at any element of it in isolation tends not to give a realistic picture of what the wider issues are. And undoubtedly, to my mind, uh, in any event, that uh, one of the biggest challenges that faces the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in the round is that of resource. Uh, if there was a sufficiency of resource in terms of the centralised marking and indeed a sufficiency of resource to support local fiscals, then possibly the benefits of the centralised uh, marking units would be, uh, would be realised in a much more immediate and apparent way than is currently the case. I suppose I'd echo a lot of the points that Callum raised there. Um, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal is part of a cog of justice, as we all understand, and we, we all have uh, tightening budgets at present. So I suppose that if you look at um, sharing resource within offices, etc., it's, go it's going to save money. We get that. Um, in fact, we do the same ourselves within policing. The disadvantage of that is, um, as Callum's alluded to, um, trying to get 
hold of a fiscal can be really problematic, which can, um, when they're so busy in the morning marking case papers, is at times we need to get warrants quickly and we don't have the ability to do that. So to actually get justice um, delivered quickly and efficiently, that becomes a, a problem for us. Um, but I think the biggest thing is just about that whole local relationship that Rachel's already alluded to. Um, previously, we could go and have a good, meaningful conversation with a procurator fiscal prior to case papers being marked, and sometimes that could actually assist with the movement of justice when you have that, um, that trusted relationship where you can have conversations. Okay. Satisfied. John Finney. <coughs> Chief Superintendent Crossan, can I pick up on that last remark you made? Because that's, <coughs> excuse me, I, I'm not conscious that it's featured before the issue around warrants. Could you clarify what that is, please? Certainly. Um, members, both from Callum's members and my own, um, regularly speak about their um, frustrations about trying to get warrants quickly. Um, now, some of that comes from inconsistent practice, but more often um, it's about access to a procurator fiscal who has the time or the ability um, to make that decision there and then. Um, quite often we come in the morning, there'll be a series of crimes over uh, the course of the last 24 hours, which may lead to us uh, requiring a, a, a warrant and requiring it quickly. Uh, and our members often get frustrated that um, the fiscals are too busy marking papers and there's not that resilience to actually then take somebody away from that to sign warrants for us. Uh, could you maybe just clarify for the record then why speed is of the essence in these instances, please? Yeah, absolutely. And if we've had, um, I'll take an example of when we've had information overnight about drugs um, in a particular place, then uh, if we need a warrant to get that, then we need to get them quickly before they get moved on. Um, we often get housebreakings taking place at night where we get information where the property may be. So it's obviously um, fundamental that we get warrants quickly to move on that. So we make the approach to the Procurator Fiscal to get access uh, to Sheriff to get the warrant. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if a question, please, to, to Callum Steele. Uh, Callum, in, in addition, in the written evidence, you talked about um, the centralisation um, problematic in terms of marking and process. And one of the processes you allude to is, or in fact, I'll just quote your evidence, which is simple tasks like the reciting of witnesses at adjournments could be easily resolved at court if fiscal's officers had the ability to produce new citations. Now, we've heard a lot about the perennial problem of the number of witnesses cited, multiple citations, very few people being called. Is that something you think could be resolved? The, the latter, Very, the, the, the latter. I, don't mean the, 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 I don't mean the global um, issue. I mean the issue if, if there was the ability to recite locally. Well, that, that ability used to exist, and uh, by virtue of its former existence, we know that it worked. Uh, the, the removal of the ability to effectively cite locally is, in its own right, creates additional bureaucracy and additional delay. Uh, you know whether. Uh, whether that remains insurmountable or not, I suspect the answer is no. Uh, like a lot of things, and you know, we, we if, even if I look at uh, the organisation that I work for, the Police Service of Scotland, we see that you know things have been set up uh, and they get tailored and uh, tweaked as uh, as they as they settle in, and maybe some of the some of the, the conceptual ideas of what might have been better achieved in one central place uh, develop into realising that uh, maybe the way it was was wasn't so bad in the first place. Okay, thanks. And, and you also talk about the additional administration costs for the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service and the Police Service in terms of processing and service. Are police officers involved in the, pro, uh, in the service of citations? Yeah. Uh, that was historically the position and then changed to... Has it been reinstated then? Uh, uh, the, um uh, yes, I mean, police, police officers have always, to some extent, been involved in the service of citations. It's just the question as to what degree, um, and that degree at this moment in time, whilst it's not enormous, it, it does exist. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, Rona, followed by Mary. I wanted to clarify a point in relation to some of the evidence that's been given in relation to warrants in NICP. The National Initial Case Processing Unit, which marks the cases that are received from the police, is not engaged in consideration of search warrants, which I think is what Mr Crossman was referring to, um, that are submitted by the police. So the indication given that there is a delay in processing of search warrants on account of marking doesn't match up with the experience I have operationally on that our members have operationally. 
Um, what might be at play there, however, is what we've referred to in our evidence, and I'm sure we will go on to refer to over the course of the morning, is the impact that um, our budgetary constraints have in relation to the resource constraints on members across the service. Okay, that clarification, is that helpful? Yeah. Okay, move on to Rona and then Mary. Thank you, Convener. Yes, I'd like to ask a question of Fiona Edie and Stephen Murray, please. Um, it's in relation to uh, financial constraints affecting staffing levels. Um, can I ask if, we, if trainees are taking on a lot more casework and um, is more work formally been done by, that would have been done by legal staff, been, been taken on by non-legal staff? And I'm also thinking in particular of um, short-term contracts that we've been hearing about. If you can maybe elaborate on what effect that's having on the, the system. Um, yes, it's true to say that uh, trainees are doing uh, a lot of the operational work. Um, that's always, uh, in many ways, been the case, um, particularly in the second year. They have a two-year training contract. In the second year of that contract, um, they spend uh, a lot of time um, in court. Uh, that's the first opportunity that they have to, to appear in court. Um, I think our concern, and probably the concern of the trainees would be as well, um, is that it is a, a contract for training and they need to have um, adequate opportunities uh, to be properly trained. Uh, we have a duty as an organisation to uh, properly train the, the, the solicitors of, of tomorrow. Um, uh, and the difficulty is that they are being relied on very heavily um, in, in a way um, some somewhat um, unfairly referred to as, as court fodder. Um, we uh, are struggling in terms of our staff resource to cover um, all the court commitments that we have. Um, and it's not uncommon in those circumstances to see trainees um, doing uh, sort of back-to-back -back courts um, frequently and, and and I don't think that's something that's um, appropriate um, in the circumstances. They need to have the, the adequate time for proper training. Um, I think the other part of your question was about um, the uh, admin um, involvement. And I'll perhaps let Stephen answer that, that particular aspect. Yeah, I'd be happy to take that on board and answer that. Uh, as a union, PCS have grave concerns about the number of fixed term contracts within the service. Now, there are uh, good reasons for that. We have a, a constant training programme almost taking place because uh, the, the fixed term staff don't stay for any longer than two years. But um, we do, uh, uh, the experience tells us that many of them move on because all, these aren't uh, full time permanent posts that they've got. So they're obviously applying for, uh, for jobs in other areas. So the turnover is very, very high, and that's something that, that gives us a, a problem uh, in terms of training. There's also, I would. Um, uh, remark on uh, as a, a, low, a lowering of quality of applicant. Uh, in the past, the, the civil service, particularly uh, in the, the COPFS, has been seen as uh, a good employer and uh, an attractive proposition. Uh, what we're tending to find now is that no one is going to give up a full-time permanent post in order to come uh, as a fixed termer, who will only be kept on for a maximum of, say, for example, two years. Another thing I would say is, uh, as a union, I don't think we're doing any favours to the, the young people who we have uh, doing the fixed, fixed term work because um, the, there's no security for them. Uh, they, they, they know they're only going to be there for an, an indefinite, uh, for a definite amount of time. And in terms of getting, uh, getting on in life and getting mortgages, it's getting harder and harder now to get mortgages and many lenders will not give to people unless they have full-time permanent employment. So from that point of view that the, the PCS union have uh, concerns about the, the, the number we have and the reliance that we have on the having fixed term staff. Can I, can I just ask you on the sort of time scale of this, how long, you know, what's, what's this trajectory been? How long has this been happening? You know, is it, is it over Gradual a process. Of years, it, it, it's getting more and more now, though, because I think the last, uh, certainly since I've been involved uh, in, in the level of union work that I'm doing at the moment, the last two years has seen a, an increase in. Um, fixed term staff certainly in the admin grades um, and the only full time, sorry, the only permanent uh, jobs that are, are on, uh, on at the moment for uh, the admin gra grades is the, the modern apprenticeships that, that the, the department take on each year. Just to clarify, and you, do you believe this is down to financial constraints 
Completely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, after discussions with um, senior people within the service, um, the, the, I do have sympathies but because it's really difficult for them to uh, basically uh, put, juggle so many balls in the air with uh, what, what is that, a decrease, uh, often a decrease in budget or a stagnating bu budget. And uh, they, they, ha they have to do what's best, but, and they also have to get the work done, which is why they, they are turning to fixed term staff uh, uh, to, to that degree. Okay, thank you. I think it's contained um, in some of our written evidence, um, but the, in terms of the staffing for, for legal staff within the organisation, since 2009 we've seen an almost 8% drop uh, in the number of uh, deputies that, or legal staff that we employ, um, and that's something that uh, we would like to, to see reversed. Thank you. It would probably, um, I don't think you've actually put in record yet the, the cut in monetary terms, have you? In, uh, it's in your written submission, but it would probably be helpful to have that yes, on well, record. Yes, absolutely. In, in terms of the, um, the overall budget for uh, COPFS, um, in, the, uh, in this uh, financial year, the budget is 113.45 uh, million. Um, in 2009-10, it was 118.3 million. Um, and we've calculated that um, if our budget had kept uh, pace with inflation, that would have amounted now to 144.5 uh, million, which means that in a real terms, our budget has been cut by over 21.5%. Uh, uh, 21 That's ne nearly a quarter of our budget. It's good to put on record. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Mary Farrell by Douglas. Thank you, um, convener. My first question follows on from the questions that, that Rona was asking in relation to staffing. So I suppose my question specifically is, is to um, Stephen. The, the briefing, the, the paper you've given us talks about specialised units. Are there fixed term staff in the specialised units or are they permanent staff? Yeah, um, when you come in as a fixed term, uh, fixed term person, then the, it, it, it's down for the, the senior managers to decide where you go. And that could be in one of the specialised units. I don't have any um, definite information for you in terms of how many or, or what the ratio would be, but the, the fixed-term person coming in would be expected to do the same work as the, the permanent uh, member of staff. So th th there's no reason why they wouldn't go into one of the specialist units. Although, as I said to you, I don't have any uh, definite uh, information at, at hand as to uh, th th whether that's the case or numbers. But in terms of where uh, new staff go when they start, it's just decided that w which section has the greater need. So if one of the specialist, specialised units was understaffed for any particular reason, then there, there's no reason to suggest that they wouldn't be put there. But, I mean, would you agree that if you're putting fixed-term staff in a specialist unit, the very nature of it being a specialist unit, it would, it would depend and rely on the staff building up an expertise in that area? And if someone's only there for two years, it would be difficult for them to build up a real expertise and understanding. And then if they move on, it, it will have, a, I would suspect, an impact on, on the, the unit itself. Yeah, uh, as I alluded to previously, that the, the problem comes with training, because there's a constant training process when you have such a high turnover of staff. Uh, in terms of the specialised units, I don't think uh, I would put any more um, importance in what they do than the work they do in, in the other units. So uh, it really is just a case of uh, managing your staff as best you can. And as long as you've got a, a hard core of experienced staff, then they, they should be able to take on the fixed term uh, people and have them up and running uh, as, in, uh, in the normal manner uh, uh, as any other employee that we have. You also mentioned um in, in the, the paper, the, the high percentage of reworked cases. You see, P PCS believe we have a high percentage of reworked cases. Do you have any um, idea what the exact figure is? No, it, it's really an anecdotal evidence rather than, than, than exact figures. For, for my own experience, I, I work in the Sheriff and Jury Unit, and we see a lot of cases getting adjourned for a whole number of reasons. Uh, they're, they're, to be frank, there, there's too many cases going into court and there's too, too little court time. So the, the, the legal people have a, a very difficult job in terms of taking the, the cases. Uh, first of all, they would take the cases in terms of time bars, because that, that would, uh, that's, that, that would be, uh, make sense. And, and also that they've got to take, uh, perhaps in terms of the severity of the case, 
and uh, prioritise which ones are going to go through because, quite frankly, as I said there, that they, there are so many cases and uh, there, there is so little court time uh, to, to get them heard in. But, but cases can uh, adjourn for a whole and get knocked on for a whole number of reasons. And very often it's out with our hands because it's the, the defence agents who are uh, maybe um, coming up with reasons for, for getting cases moved on that we don't have any say in. If, thank you. Um, and I wanted to now ask another question. That's all right, Kavina. Yes. Thank you. Um, one of the other pieces of evidence we heard as, as we've been doing this, and it's a kind of thread that, that, that's ran through, is lack of information about process in the court. And we've heard it mostly from, from witnesses, that they were unsure what was going to happen when they got to court. They were unsure what was going to happen after they'd been in court, why there'd been delays, and what the actual process would be while they were in the court. And we also heard that there was, um, not always, but sometimes, a, a, a lack of joined up communication between um, different services. And I'd be, one, I'd, I'd be interested in the panel's views on that, on how, how they think that, that side of the service works. And do, do you think that all the services work together well? I suppose to some extent that's probably a, a slightly unfair question to ask of probably police officers because we are more than familiar with the, the vagaries of the court system and our understanding and appreciation may not necessarily tally with that of others. Uh, but certainly from uh, the other witnesses that we see in court and indeed the uh, victims and complainers that we, that we deal with, um, the, and again it's only, it's only anecdotal, but the, their um, conveyed experiences to our members when we meet in court corridors, when we meet in the streets, uh, is one of often bewilderment. Uh, but that being said, I, I, I do think that to some extent the, the Victim Information Advice Service has tried to address some of that uh, insofar as it tries to at least provide uh, information in advance for a small number of people. I don't believe it does it adequately for, uh, for everybody by, by some stretch. Uh, but certainly for uh, those that are um, going through, uh, going to court in particularly difficult circumstances, and we're not saying that anybody relishes being in court in, in any event, but uh, my sense is, is that in, in that regard, the VIA is providing more information than was ever the case in the past. Where I think there is a degree of unfairness is that uh, whilst, in fact, this committee uh, gave uh, scrutiny to the, to the victim and, uh, and witnesses bill when uh, VIAs were being born, is that the public doesn't really have an appreciation of what VIA is and how it's meant to work, and they tend to look to the agencies that they know uh, for the provision of that information, and that is invariably the police service. So much of the frustration of the courts uh, gets expressed towards the police as if we have the capability to do something about it. Perhaps a different uh, experience between those who are involved um, in the serious types of cases um, and those uh, who have an experience of the summary courts. Um, I was very pleased to read um, in some of the, uh, the, the written evidence submissions um, the experience of uh, many of our criminal justice partners um, who said that the, uh, the, the work, the liaison, the communication that they had uh, with staff in COPFS who were dealing with, uh, with homicide cases, with sexual offence cases, uh, was first class and second to none, I think, were some of the descriptions. Yeah. Um, I think, however, there is um, a, a, a difference uh, when it comes to dealing with the, the, the summary courts. Um, there has been an understandable focus um, on serious crime. Um, however, I think what, what blights local communities and what will fill your post bags, uh, and, and our members are part of those communities as well, um, is that sort of lower level uh, sort of antisocial behaviour uh, type of offences. Um, and I, I can absolutely confidently say that uh, our members um, time and time again are going into court without adequate time to prepare the cases that, that they have in their courts. And I think um, had they had more time to prepare, they would be in a better position to be able to liaise uh, with those uh, victims and witnesses who are attending um, at court. To prepare is that down to timetabling in court or number of cases? 
to do with a lack of staff resource. If we, ha it, it, we have so many cases, um, let's say you have 10 cases, uh, uh, 10 courts running um, in, uh, in a, a given court on a given day, and you maybe have nine staff in your unit to cover those courts. So you're borrowing somewhere uh, from within the organisation to get somebody to come and, and fill uh, that additional court. What we also know is that there's been an increase in the number of trials that are running. There's been about, I think it's eight point, it's over 8% uh, over the last four years, the, num the number of cases that are running to trial. We also know that the length of the courts that are running, the trials courts are finishing much later in the afternoon. So it used to be, I think it was always a matter of some kind of a disbelief. People thought that the, the, the people involved in the criminal justice system were working a half day, that you know they, they were finished at four o'clock. That's not the case. They were coming back to the office and they were preparing their courts for the next day. What's happening now is that the courts are running on much longer. So that time that they originally had uh, to be able to prepare for, for the next courts, bearing in mind you don't have that staff resilient, somebody else sitting in the office preparing for tomorrow's court, they're going back and they're either having to stay late in the office or take work home. Uh, you know, we are, we are meeting our obligations, but it is at a human cost to, our, uh, to the health and welfare of our members. Could court sit too then? Um, Rachel could probably help you better with some of the information on, on some of our courts. I think it varies depending on which jurisdiction you're talking about. I can speak from personal experience in Glasgow that it is not uncommon for courts to run past 4pm and sometimes past 5pm. I think the worst example um, that I've experienced certainly in the last two years was a court, a trials court that sat till after 6pm. Now that obviously has a knock-on effect on, as Fiona said, the health and welfare of our members and, and actually their ability to prepare because you're talking about them preparing a trials court for the next day of between 10 and sometimes up to 14 or more trials. And if they are to give the attention to them that they deserve, they require more preparation time for that. Thank you. Do any other panel members want to comment on um, the original question around lack of information about process? But it's very helpful what you've said. It's very helpful. Actually, just back to what Fiona and Rachel were saying there, as someone who's an admin manager within the section, I see first-hand experience each day of deputies are given cases in the morning of the, when the trial is starting, and they have to read that and prepare themselves before they get to court. Now, that's not because of uh, a bad preparation in anybody's part. It may be because uh, that somebody's off sick. It may be that, that somebody hasn't come to work for whatever reason. And there's such, such lack of resilience and uh, uh, lack of, uh, in terms of the staffing, but within the, the, the legal ranks as well, although I'm principally here to uh, defend the, the admin uh, sections. That, that, yeah, I can give you first-hand experience of the difficulties that they face by having to get into a very important trial in which you have victims there at court and, and uh, witnesses who have all taken the time to come. <coughs> and I think the public at large would be alarmed if they, if they knew that, that this was happening through no fault of their own, because they're, they're trying their best to go into court and, and uh, to, to, to see justice done with uh, very um, limited resources. I suppose the impact on, sta on, on staffing and the pressures will also have an impact on the amount of information they can impart on the people that are, that are, that are appearing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Again, could I perhaps just get on record um, the sickness leave absences and um, attributable to mental health and also the stress. It would be good to have that on record. It's in the written submission from the unions. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, the, the committee will have seen that um, across the civil service, the average working days lost uh, due to, to sickness um, is 7.2 days. Um, and within COPFS, that figure is 10.3. Um, of those on sick leave, um, it's 27% uh, um, of those are due to um, mental ill health um, and, and of, of those on, uh, related to mental ill health, 76% is recorded as being due to stress. Uh, and that, I think, kind of reiterates the points that, that, that we've been keen to make, which is about the health and welfare of our, of our staff. The pressure, the stress, the lack of resource. Can I perhaps ask, um, has the Inspectorate of Prosecution in Scotland independent strategy, uh, statutory inspectorate for COPFS picked up on this, dealt with it and highlighted this in any way? 
the, the staffing levels, um, the sorry, the sickness level. levels. Yeah. Uh, I'm not aware that they have as a specific point, no. That would be something that seems to me fairly germane to the operation of the Grand Park Creative Fisco and something that perhaps um, would be helpful to pick up on. My understanding, and, and I, I'm not certain that it's correct, mm -hmm. is that the focus of the uh, inspectorate is more on the operational work of the organisation. Um, so whether that's something that they would focus on within their, uh, their, their scope of responsibility, I'm not sure. Um, certainly it's something that we are um, committed to working with the department to try and to, to seek to address. Um, it's in nobody's interest to have uh, high levels of sickness within any organisation. We want our staff to be um, at work, but we want them to be well and healthy um, at work. Um, so, for example, one of the things that we have been looking at and trying to work with the department on um, is trying to agree um, what reasonable preparation time might look like, because we know from a former uh, staff survey that, that the union carried out um, that uh, the lack of preparation time was, was as a seen as being a significant stressor uh, to our staff um, uh, and we know that workload in itself uh, is an issue which features highly in relation to work-related stress. So all of these um, all of these sort of resource, workload, preparation time, all of these issues are factors which we believe are significantly um, impacting on those sickness levels. Yeah, it would seem to me there's certainly a link there to be investigated. Um, I'm not sure, Mr Crossan, did you want to come in on something uh, earlier? I was just going back to the um, support for victims. Uh, one of the things that we need to recognise is that many of our victims now are extremely vulnerable. And they'll be traumatised um, by the, the crimes that they've been involved in. So some of these cases are, are extremely complex. So actually, when we're providing um, information and guidance, is it's not easily picked up and quite often it's actually getting people needing to go back and get more and more support. So there's more and more pressure getting put in services to provide that information so that we're victim centred. Thank you for that. And a supplementary, Oliver Mundell. I just wanted to come back on the previous point around uh, sickness absence. I think it is worrying that it's creeped uh, into the double figures and it is a bit of a, a sort of warning uh, signal. But I just wondered how you felt that related uh, to some of the um, figures that had come out of the civil service people's survey results, uh, because I think it's quite uh, concerning that, you know, effectively one in 10 people want to leave the service as soon as possible, that 15% uh, say they're being bullied at work and that a fifth of people uh, say they don't have the tools to do their job. And those two things sort of, I think, would seem to be quite heavily related. Um, Certainly in terms of anecdotal evidence from our members, I think there is undoubtedly a connection, at least in, in the minds of our members. Um, on the ground, it certainly feels that there's a connection between those two elements of it. And again, it comes down to us having enough to do what is required of us um, and actually what the people of Scotland expect of us. And it's clear from the evidence that the committee have received both in writing and so far, some of the oral evidence, I know you have some way to go in terms of oral evidence, but it's clear that the expectations on us as an organisation are high and properly high. But that is an expectation that then weighs on our members when they find themselves in a position where they are um, often struggling to deliver to the standard expected of them. And I think that some of that is borne out by the survey results that you've mentioned, but in particular it's borne out by the sickness levels. Because, I mean, one of the other concerns that's come up is that a number uh, of staff, particularly at a junior level, don't feel that they've got the discretion or the authority to do the job that they're being asked to do uh, and, and find it very difficult to navigate their way through the system. And I just wonder, you know, when you've got a fifth of people saying that they're not able to fulfil uh, their duties, is, is it because they don't feel uh, supported or empowered to, to take the decisions that are in the best interests of justice? I need to be careful here not to stray into matters of policy because that wouldn't be appropriate in this forum. Um, there are undoubtedly members who have fed back to us that they feel a loss of discretion. 
I think it's important to say that there has never been an unfair to discretion on prosecutors across Scotland. We have always worked within guidelines given to us uh, from the Lord Advocate and through his commission to local commission holders as procurators fiscal. Um, but certainly there is a, a sense of that on the ground amongst many of our members. Um, can I just ask if there's anything from the uh, PCSE's perspective on these issues, given they're highlighted so clearly in your evidence? My job is a, a union rep. If I didn't highlight the, um, the, the fact that, that 10.2 or 10.3 days, rather, is very, very high in terms of the, 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 the civil service is a norm. And um, the, the, I see first-hand experience from my members uh, that pe people come in and they're very, very stressed, leading to uh, being off sick. And it, it, it's not always um, a short-term sick leave. But very often what, what's putting these figures so high is people who, who are often long-term sick leave. And, and we do have uh, attendance management um, policies in place to try and attract them back to work uh, as best we can. But it's very often difficult because um, you know, it's not just maybe having a sore leg. The sore leg will improve through time. But the, the, you know, going back to work, but when you feel so pressurised, uh, and uh, I, I share the, the, the concerns of the, the, the FDA re representatives as well, that they, I have to confess also that they, they have got the, the pressure at a higher degree because they go into court. They, they are very much the uh, public face of uh, the, the department. So our guys on the admin side are, are basically behind the scenes, if you like, in the main. But there's no doubt that there is still a considerable amount of pressure on our staff, and I think that's reflected in the figures and also within the opinions of people in the staff surveys that you mentioned. I think just going back to the, the, the staff survey, the one that you're quoting from, I think, was the 2015 survey. Um, we have just completed, uh, it's an annual one, and we've just completed uh, the survey for this year. Uh, we don't yet have the results uh, published for that yet. I think what the committee may wish to bear in mind, however, is that in the course of the last year, um, we've had significant change in terms of the senior leadership within the organisation. We obviously we have a new Crown agent and we also have new law officers officers um, in terms of the discretion that you talk about and the, um, the pressure that that puts uh, onto individual members. I think Rachel's right to, to make the point that there never has been an unfettered discretion there. We've always operated within guidelines. However, um, the committee may be aware of um, a, a, a speech that was made recently by the Lord Advocate um, where he's signalled that um, they, they want to empower staff um, and to uh, instil in them a sense of confidence about their decision making uh, and certainly from the, um, the sort of anecdotal evidence that I've heard um, from members is that's been very well received. Um, it will take, I think, some time to, to filter through because a change in, in sort of in culture and approach um, and that, that skill needs to be um, sort of to, to be redeveloped um, with our members as well um, will take some time. So, you know, it may be useful to look at not just this year's staff survey results, but the one that will be published sort of or carried out next year as well. And, and, and we were hopeful that we'll start to see um, a, a sort of an improvement in that regard. Thank you. We may have um, other questions um, on policy and um, how, that, um, how that impacts on judicial discretion. Mary, was it a supplementary on staffing and sickness levels? Supplementary to Mary Fee's question earlier, so <laughs> I, I'm a bit behind there, so okay. I don't know if you want to continue Move with on. that okay. and then I can ask these questions after. Douglas followed by Liam. Oh, sir Crossman, uh, you both represent the same profession. Uh, I presume you've read each other's submissions. Do you think it's a fair reflection that I took from the two submissions that these are quite starkly different, given that you are both representing police officers? And could you maybe uh, give your views on that? I can probably start on that. Um, although we represent the same organisation, we represent different members of that, um, so the engagement is at a totally different level. So um, the evidence that I've provided is showing that at a strategic level, is that my members are confident that they have um, an excellent working relationship with the uh, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, and indeed other stakeholders who are trying to um, better uh, the delivery of justice. Um, we absolutely recognise at uh, the front end of policing 
um, the impact of some of the changes within a uh, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and how that's um, affecting some of our officers. However, I've tried to balance uh, our submission as round about our members and how they feel um, that efficiency and effectiveness is taking place. And perhaps to put a bit of context round about that is if you look at um, some of the work that's getting done by the Justice Board, etc., to try and have processes in place to actually make us more efficient and effective across um, the partnership, a lot of that work is ongoing, but it's, it's unseen um, by our, our frontline police officers just now um, because the, the processes haven't yet been developed, the IT structures aren't placed to do that. Uh, there's challenges round about finance to deliver some of these efficiencies. Um, but the feedback from my members is overwhelmingly um, that they are comfortable that they have a good working relationship with the uh, Crown Office of Procurator Fiscal Service. Just maybe before we come on to Mr Steele, though, I mean, your superintendents um, are the, the level some officers would go to to raise their concerns. So are you saying from your submission and from what you've just said that superintendents aren't receiving some of the stories that we get from um, Mr Steele's organisation? No, absolutely not. Um, we, we are absolutely familiar with the fact is that um, we understand that our officers get affected by not being able to sit or going to court and getting countermanded at the last stage. That affects them and, the, and their families. We're having to readjust that. We do recognise the fact that um, procurators fiscals don't seem to have enough court preparation time, so they're attending court potentially unprepared, not through their fault. What we do recognise is that the, the staff who work there are very, very professional and very, very dedicated, working under extremely uh, difficult circumstances. So whilst um, I recognise the challenges there, I, I would appreciate that Callum's submission would, would give you, from a frontline officer's perspective, I'm trying to balance that from um, the operational leaders of policing to say, actually, at a strategic level, we feel as if there is good engagement. Well, what I think we agree is that certainly the quality of engagement we have with the staff when we meet them and deal with them on a one-to-one -one basis is, uh, to use the term that I vote in evidence and has been used today, is, is second to none. You know, we're dealing with uh, highly dedicated professional public servants that want to do the best uh, under very trying and difficult circumstances. Uh, but you know, let there be no doubt that the, uh, the issues that were identified in the written evidence I submitted are absolutely uh, the experience of, uh, of our members. Of course, they're not uh, representative of, of uh, a, you know, a homogenous police service. And, uh, you, know, that's, you know, that's why we have different associations representing uh, different views. Uh, but uh, as I'm sure you appreciate yourself, uh, Mr. Ross, the, the experience of the rank and file police officers is generally uh, not uh, the same as that of senior officers. Can I ask, one of, <coughs> excuse me, one of the issues um, that I thought was quite stark was the, the use of use of digital technology. Uh, now, you're really saying in, in your submission that you don't think it will make a great deal of difference, whereas the um, superintendents are, are saying, you know, the digital vault is a great way forward. Uh, and perhaps you could both discuss that, but particularly Mr Crossman, I wanted to ask you about your point. You say a digital evidence vault is most welcome given the sin uh, significant increase in cases where there is a digital footprint. When we had our very first panel here, we were speaking to defence advocates from across Scotland, and I was questioning them on digital um, evidence, and one of them said, Stephen Manifield, um, forgive me if I do not get the terminology absolutely right, a vi virtual evidence vault, um, and then he went on to, to explain it, and he said, if that can be brought into existence, and it is very much only at the talking shop stage, it would help. So from your submission, you would almost read it to say that it's operational, it's working well, yet we've got defence agents coming to this committee saying it's just a talking shop, it's something pie in the sky that has got good intentions, but they're not using it. So could you maybe, uh, do you understand that difference? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And if I can just clarify, I'm not saying it's up and running and efficient. What I'm saying is we welcome the fact that we're moving to a digital vault. Um, I'm sure the, the committee members will absolutely understand is that uh, more and more of crime now has a digital footprint across it, whether that's the taking of CCTV, whether it's the taking of people's mobile phones, their computers, their tablets, or whatever. Uh, and a common frustration that comes to us from members of the public is that actually we take their telephones off them, um, which can be their only means of contact for other people. It costs them a lot of money because they're in contracts and we don't have the ability to give them it back because it becomes a, um, a piece of evidence. Now, anything that can actually make that easier um, to stop um, taking phones, etc., away from people, and also 
to get the evidence from that in a format that can be easily um, produced in court, because that's one of our, our biggest challenges, has got to be welcomed. Now, that, that works on going back under the uh, Justice Board subcommittee, I think it's the digital something, I can't remember exactly what it's called. So there's work on going to do that, and we absolutely welcome that, because that's been a challenge that's been here for a number of uh, years, um, and whilst it's still work in progress, I think we've got to recognise that that's the kind of stuff that's ongoing in the background. I think it's important to clarify that in the, in the written evidence submitted by the Scottish Police Federation in my name, when, when we were talking about the, uh, the, the, the technological challenges, uh, we didn't specifically uh, come on to the, 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 the um, digital evidence vault. It was more about the practical experiences of what we're dealing with today. Um, and I suppose to some extent we may be getting on to that question shortly, I, I, I suspect. I took the quote, it's difficult to envisage that any technological advancements could expedite the current processes, so, which seems... I think that was specifically relative to the question of fatal accident inquiries. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure from the evidence that that was the case. It, the final one to, to uh, Mr Crossman and Mr Steele before I, I come on to the rest is, uh, again, a, a very different opinion in terms of officers being cited for a uh, court to give evidence. Um, uh, Mr Steele, you mentioned how it's very disjointed. You know, there's not a good, um, a particularly good way of doing it. It's been a problem for many years that doesn't seem to be addressed. Uh, yet, um, Mr Crossman says that um, uh, better use of the police witness uh, scheduler should lead to a reduction in citing officers for court during days off. Do you think that is progressing well? Whereas Mr Steele is saying, you know, we've tried a number of things to change police witnesses being called uh, and, and the feelings they're in, and it hasn't improved over recent years. This is an issue that I ask nearly everyone, because it's an issue I get from a lot of frontline officers, uh, very close to home sometimes, uh, about the number of officers who are called, who are then taken off our streets, our communities, then don't have the bobbies on the beat uh, with a very uh, visible presence because they're stuck in a, a room at the back of a court or potentially in the police station, but they're certainly not out on our streets. Um, and really, what can we do to address this problem? Is it more about agreeing evidence? Uh, is it more about being realistic in terms of the cases that we're calling? What can we do to ensure that all witnesses uh, are treated well, but that we're not wasting so much police resources with citing so many police witnesses that are never called to give evidence? Well, at the risk of incurring the wraths of sheriffs, uh, I believe we need to have our court system uh, working at times that are more attuned to when the demand on the police services. The uh, attempts at dealing with uh, police witness scheduling was being trialled. I suspect it was being trialled a long time before I joined, but certainly it was being trialled when I joined uh, 23 years ago. Uh, there have been various iterations of it over the, over the piece, and the problem still continues unabated. Uh, I, th I think for reasons that have been uh, referenced or alluded to today, uh, when we've got uh, preparation that's taking place as little as 24 hours before the trial, for entirely understandable reasons, uh, that points to a service, in fact, points to wider justice, criminal justice PLC, in need of a significant investment of, uh, of money. Uh, the peak police demand invariably occurs between the hours of 6 o'clock in the evening and 4 o'clock in the morning, yet the peak abstraction for police for courts uh, takes place between the hours of nine o'clock in the morning and five o'clock in the afternoon. That's not, to my mind, logical. Uh, and invariably moving resources from one point of the day to service uh, another part of the criminal justice system in another part of the day is only ever going to create a merry-go-round of, uh, of disturbance. So, to my mind, and this ultimately comes down to what it is that Scotland wants. Do we want a, a justice system that's invested in and carries the confidence of our communities? And if so, then it's time someone put their hand in their pockets and took some difficult decisions uh, about the investment in courts, about having our courts sitting beyond uh, the hours that they currently sit, and uh, about putting investment in both police, prosecutors, sheriff, sheriff clerks, the whole shebang. I would echo that, uh, Callum's points. I think, uh, come back to the, the police witness, uh, Schegler, the, the issue just now is, a, is an IT solution. So a lot of the stuff that we would hope would work well is not just now because the, it's the police IT system cannot support the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal System. Um, if we could get a solution for that, which there is one there, which will cost, uh, will take an investment, but for me it's probably an investment that would realise um, a benefit. 
Um, what that could do is the, the witness scheduler could go online and data mine into Scope, which is the, the database we use for personnel, and it could see what shifts people are on. So you could get real-time information rather than it going by email and paperwork, which is clearly inefficient. Um, I think it's also important to recognise that within policing, we are doing our bit to try and reduce the amount of witnesses who are actually cited for court. Traditionally, um, police officers have named every single person that they take a statement from within a, a police report and called them a witness, when the reality of it is they probably are never going to be a witness. And we've already heard evidence um, from our colleagues that there's insufficient time for fiscals to read some of these cases in advance to actually take out the unnecessary witnesses. So there is work between ourselves and the Crown on going to to educate officers to put people in, name them, but put in brackets that they're non-witnesses rather than witnesses, and that itself should actually reduce the amount of people who have to attend court. But, but also, presumably, on that point, before I come to other witnesses, or they, they might want to come in, if so much work is being done at the very last minute because of the, the lack of resources, if there's any plea bargaining or anything like that, or if there's uh, cases that maybe, you know, once you get all the evidence, you decide you know, it's not going to go forward, or you might be able to come to another conclusion. That's on the day these people have already been cited. They've been taken away from their leaves, their days off with their family, they've had their shifts changed already. So even if you get the IT system, and I always worry when we speak about IT systems, because Scotland seems to have a particularly bad uh, way of doing this at the moment, even if we got that IT system sorted and we looked at that as a focus, that's not going to solve the problems of a lot of the cases just being looked at in the last 24 hours, because the IT system might work, but we still have the backlogs uh, there. And, and maybe on that, because my question to PCS and the FDA was about technology, and you both briefly mentioned technology. At PCS, you had quite an interesting point about the contractors um, that come in to, to work with some of the, the technology, but then don't seem to share that information. Um, did I pick up correct that there was maybe a wastage of funds there in terms of we're paying quite a lot of money for these contractors to come in to deal with the technology and then only train some staff, but maybe not all staff. And the FDA was saying that the benefits may not be realised for months or years. So really, what is your view on more technology within our court system? And is it uh, the big thing that we're looking for that could address many of our concerns, or is it just a side issue that might make some improvements, but not the big change that we need? That first, excuse me. <clears throat> No, the, the concerns we had as a union uh, concerned that the, um, the, the the IT side of the the, the organisation, and um, I think uh, for what we can gather, uh, seven hundred thousand, uh, seven hundred thirty thousand pound to be exact, is uh, it, it may actually be more than that. Uh, from what I'm led to believe, because this is only contractors, this isn't including uh, other specialists that, that they're bringing in in, in different areas. Now, our concern has always been to get good value for money for the department, and um, the, the problem that we have is, that the, the difficulty we have is that there's no knowledge transfer being passed on to the in-house IT staff. And we think that the, there should be contractual obligations to the contractors when they're coming in, that yes, that, that, you know, we want you to come in and fix the, the, the problems that we face, but we also want you to, to, uh, to show our guys how it's done so that that can cut down in future uh, budgets that, that, that we can maybe bring the, the level spent on contractors down. And the, the way I would describe it is if, if somebody came in to fix your telly and it wasn't working, you would ask them you know, what's wrong. And if it was a fairly simple solution, you wouldn't be phoning them out a second time because you, you would hope that you, you, you could fix it yourself. So really, that, that's all we're asking for. And for whatever reason, and I don't know why, uh, we, we do have concerns about this. And, and, and I think the answers that we're getting back aren't sufficient because uh, the, the IT guys, dare I say, it, tend to have a, a high opinion of themselves and, and think that they're above uh, other areas of the department. So th th that's something that we definitely have concerns about. Um. My understanding, we meet quite regularly, both trade unions meet with the director uh, for IT, uh, for ISD within COPFS, and the information that he has um, given us is that, um, and my understanding is that there is a requirement on the contractors that come to us um, to impart that, that sort of knowledge uh, transfer that, that you're talking about. I can't comment about whether in practice that's occurring, um, but as I say, my understanding is that it is a requirement of the contractors who, who are used. Um, I think my under, my, the other aspects of all of that is uh, the 
the use of a contractor for some of the specialist tasks that are required um, is because there will, be, there, there will be certain aspects of the day-to-day -day running of any IT system that you require to have people on the ground and available every day um, to, to be able to respond to. There will be other things that don't crop up every day and it, it, it's therefore not considered to be um, essential to retain those staff on a permanent basis so you bring them in on an as and when needed um, basis. Um, I think your question about whether we think that um, the benefits will be realised um, quickly or not, um, I, like any changes, I, th I think the, the aspect, the, the, the part of our submission that you, you might be referring to were some of the other um, kind of structural reforms and changes that, 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 would, that, were, uh, that have occurred um, in, in recent time. But, um, for example, one of the big uh, issues that... Um, well, one of the big introductions that we're awaiting uh, is the introduction of um, iPads into court. So rather than taking big bundles of files, uh, fiscals will be taking in an iPad in, instead where all of the information will, will be. Um, uh, I think in some respects that just may be a, a different method for them to, to access that information. Um, I think probably the savings um, probably relate more to the admin staff who have to spend a lot of time physically putting together bundles of papers for court on any given day. Uh, and the idea is that, um, the, uh, that that will take place sort of electronically. Um, there are a number of dependencies on all of that operating effectively. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I can, I can speak about some of those if, if you want. Uh, I think just for the record, it was page five of your submission uh, where you said, we know that work continues within COPFS to exploit new technology solutions and streamline work practices in order to deal with the challenges we have outlined. The continued difficulty for our member is that su such a strategy um, uh, is that any benefit felt in such changes may not be realised for months or even years down the line. Um, and I suppose that maybe goes back to all these people on short-term contracts as well. You know, why would you um, come up to speed to develop your use with these new technologies if, you know, if you're not sure you're going to be there to use them uh, in the long term as well? Yeah, well, I th that we, we have welcomed um, the recent uh, recruitment, where, which has seen um, some additional permanent uh, appointments having been made. Um, but yes, there, there, there remains uh, an element of reliance upon uh, fixed term contractors. And I think, you know, unless and until the organisation is sufficiently resourced to have an adequate staff, full staff complement, that's likely, to, and whilst the pressures remain on their overall uh, budgets, that that position is likely to remain. To Liam, then Fulton. Thank you very much. Uh, convener, I'm hoping after his comments about the IT team that Stephen doesn't go back to the office and find he's locked out of his email system. But um, I, I just I want, I want to go back to some of the remarks that Callum Steele was offering in relation to uh, some of the problems faced. I mean, you've been, I think, understandably complimentary about the professionalism of those in the COPF uh, system and, and, and acknowledge the um, constraints they're under in terms of budgets and personnel, but where you are critical in your evidence, you suggest that COPFS policy decisions directly impact on the capacity of the courts and, by extension, COPFS staff. And these primarily relate to cases, usually but not exclusively domestic violence cases, where it is known from the outset that there is not a sufficiency of evidence to secure a conviction, yet the, case, uh, the cases proceed regardless. I wonder if you could maybe expand uh, on that, because uh, it seems to be in no one's interest for cases to be brought forward where there is no prospect whatsoever of um, a conviction being secured, not in the interests of those bringing the cases, the, the, the witnesses, the victims themselves, uh, or indeed those um, who, uh, who find themselves accused. So, um, I, I, as I say, I welcome your further views on that and, and what we might be able to do to, to address it. Yeah, uh, certainly, and again, uh, th through the through the convener, that the, is the issues with um, the, the issues with with cases coming to court, and I appreciate that this gets into the policy area of the COPFS 
uh, which, uh, for understandable reasons, wasn't wanted to be touched on earlier on. But from a, a police perspective, you know, we speak with fiscals. You know, police officers speak with fiscals. Uh, we have conversations with them all the time, and we know uh, because, well, uh, uh, in some cases, the police officers were the arresting officers, and they know that at the time of the arrest uh, or the detention that there was probably an insufficiency of evidence because we're dealing with crime to Lord Advocate's guidelines, not to the Scottish Crime Reporting Standard, which in its own right is problematic. Now, th these are policy decisions that impact on uh, police demand from the very beginning and then impact on court demand and certainly the demand of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service staff in marking cases that have no prospect of ever going to court and then citing witnesses uh, and getting witnesses to court to go through a process that's never going to see a conviction. Now, would I be able to point to specific cases of that? I suspect the answer is yes. Uh, if we look at even some of the, the reporting, I think there was a, a fairly comprehensive uh, editorial piece undertaken by uh, one of the reporters for the Sunday Post over the past couple of weeks, uh, and uh, that reporter comment had comments from sheriffs uh, indicating that uh, they have cases that come before the courts that they know don't have the evidence, and they're not going to get prosecuted, uh, but everyone goes through the charade of getting them there because of what appears to be policy decisions. Now, that for a service, and I mean all services involved in this, that where staff are under pressure for time to go through that rigmarole, whilst that might suit a policy objective, does not seem very pragmatic in terms of uh, utilising the resources you have to the best see of of discretion because i mean in the sense you point to guidelines and guidelines by any definition um are, are open one would assume to a level of discretion but from what you're saying here that discretion doesn't appear to be being exercised by people who are in in uh, possession of pretty much all of the facts and therefore should be able to make a judgment that doesn't result in this sort of outcome well, clearly it would be inappropriate for me to speak for fiscals, and mm. uh, that, would be, that would be wholly inappropriate. But I think we heard earlier on that there, were, there was a perception, at least, that there was a lack of discretion. But if I was to draw a parallel with the police service experience for some of these cases, there is absolutely a lack of discretion. Uh, and uh, I, don't I don't want to distract this general uh, issue along a specific um, aspect to do with domestic violence, but we have got to a stage now in Scotland where couples, uh, for example, can't have a row in their house, uh, or if they do and the police are formed, there is a very strong likelihood that one of them is leaving in handcuffs. Now, there are, there are understandable reasons why the police and Crown Office focus on domestic violence has changed massively over the years. Of course there are. Um, but are we, re and, and I suspect I'm seeing tomorrow's front pages already, uh, but are we really saying that we're best served by having situations where families um, and uh, relationships are uh, have the interference of the criminal justice system just because someone happened to phone the police uh, on overhearing raised voices? Uh, Fiona, Rachel wanted to come in on, on that. Um, I think it's worth saying that in the 19, almost 19 years that I've been a prosecutor, I've never once initiated proceedings in a case where, number one, I didn't believe that a crime had been committed, and number two, that I didn't think there was a sufficiency of evidence. There is not a policy in the world that would direct our members to do such a thing, and there's not one of our members that would do such a thing in those circumstances. I think sometimes there's a misapprehension between uh, the difference between sufficiency and whether or not we might get a conviction is not the role of a prosecutor to secure a conviction in a case. There are many reasons why a conviction might not be the final outcome, but proceedings are still in the public interest. Um, I think it's also worth noting that we have an adversarial system of criminal justice. There are no right and wrong answers in the world of criminal law. A bit like medicine, it's something of an art rather than a science. And therefore, uh, there are often disputes between the Crown and the defence as to the sufficiency. There can sometimes even be disagreements between the Crown and the police as to the sufficiency. We're all working towards the same goal of ensuring that the interests of justice are served, however. And a suggestion that prosecutors in Scotland are initiating proceedings in cases where there's an insufficiency of evidence certainly is not matched by my experience or that of any of our members and is in many ways an attack on their professional dignity this because we've heard this not on one occasion, we've heard it on a multitude of occasions from di different witnesses. So I really am uh, concerned that there is this variance that, that you're representing um, so many people 
uh, who apparently we're hearing uh, feel under pressure to prosecute even when there is a, uh, an insufficiency of evidence and, and, and continue it um, to, to court with that insufficiency of evidence for we are told mm, to be able to avoid them throwing it out because they don't want the complaint. Now, that's a culture and it's the culture that we are um, hearing evidence that's running through the service from defence lawyers, from um, people who are in the court, from third sector, from the police, and yet the union representing uh, the Crown Procurator Fiscal don't recognise that. If I might comment here as well, and I would support what Rachel has said here, um, and I think there's two issues. Uh, I think, first of all, it's worth noting that um, the, our, our policy on the prosecution of domestic abuse um, is supported by organisations such as Women's Aid, Rape Crisis, uh, and others. Um, it is eff effectively a zero tolerance uh, policy, and I think in a modern Scotland, that's absolutely right that we should have such a policy. Um, I think the, the, the crucial difference in what's being described here though, um, is where there is a situation of insufficient evidence, and I agree with Rachel, I don't believe our members would, would mark a case to proceed where there was insufficient evidence, that is different because there is a different test for prosecution in Scotland about whether or not there is a realistic prospect of succeeding in, in getting a conviction. Now, that may be to do with any number of factors. Um, the attitude of the, of the complainer may be one factor, um, but there are other reasons as well. Now, it, is, it, it would be true to say that there may be cases which proceed to court where there is not a realistic prospect, uh, prospect of success in getting a conviction, that is different from saying there is insufficient evidence. Um, and, and I, test. I beg your pardon? The public interest test. Well, that, that is a matter of policy. That's, you, know, the, you have to determine upon whether, as a matter of policy, on, on zero tolerance and tackling domestic abuse, you want to, uh, to, to proceed with a prosecution um, because it's considered to be in the public interest to do so, or are you saying that you're only going to proceed uh, with a prosecution where you think there is a realistic prospect of getting a conviction? And that's not something that I can comment on. Right. I'm conscious of the time we are going to have to, to watch at this point in time. Um, Rachel Weir, and I'm conscious, Lane, I interrupted you. Is there something you want to say after Ms Weir has commented? Then I'll bring in Oliver Mundell. But this is absolutely, I cannot stress this enough, fundamental. Uh, I don't think um, the unions can come here on one hand, talk about resources, talk about the... Um, the the pressure that their members are under and not recognise what is being told the, the, the committee from such a variety of people who are working on the coal face. Rachel Weir. Uh, thank you, Convener. The, just to follow up on the point that Fiona was making in relation to the correlation, or in fact, lack of correlation between the tests for sufficiency of evidence and convictions, I think it's also important to remember that prosecutors uh, cannot and should not usurp the role of the court there are cases where there are questions as to the credibility and reliability of witnesses' evidence. Now, there might be concerns as to how that evidence might be presented. There might be uh, concerns as to how that evidence might be challenged by the defence where that matter to go to trial. And there are questions of very fine judgment that require to be carried out um, so as not to usurp the role of the court in determining where that um, assessment of the credibility and reliability of that evidence lies. Those are properly matters in summary proceedings for the presiding judge and in jury proceedings a matter for the jury and it would be wrong of prosecutors to usurp that role and that may be where some of the disparity is seen. Um, Liam, do you want to continue on Oliver on this and then uh, the rest of the questions will have to, to be quite short and short answers. Very briefly, I wanted to go back to something that Rachel said earlier in relation to the decentralised marking um, and you talked about building up an expertise because of the, the, the number of cases that are seen. Um, I, I suppose a, 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 another way of looking at that is that um, because you're seeing so many, perhaps there is more of a tendency to, to, uh, to, to, to gloss over the individual differences between those cases. And therefore, I suppose the question for us in terms of coming up with um, a, an ideal system is not to move away from having that 
central expertise, but whether or not you have local marking with the central expertise inputted into it, or you continue with the central marking uh, system that better embeds um, local uh, input um, than appears to be the case at, at, at the present time. Um, and I just wondered whether or not um, you would you would have a preference for how that uh, how that kind of gets taken forward, because clearly something needs to to change at the moment. It, it's not working um, as uh, as intended, and, and and that's not from anybody that has a particular agenda here. Just that that local expertise or that local insight and uh, those local relationships is being lost at the moment. I don't think there's any doubt. We've heard uh, evidence from a wide range of stakeholders on that front. We have quick answers would be uh, helpful. It comes down to a question of resourcing. So it's a matter then for uh, the department within the resources allocated to it to ensure that in having a team of that nature, it has sufficient resources, not only to do the job at hand, but to ensure that it has the time to take to spend with communities to hear the local input. If that model were to continue, that model were to discontinue, there are any number of options, but <coughs> Our organisation has been through a number of periods of change and it's important that we would take time to allow what is a relatively recent change to bed in, properly evaluate it before rushing to judgement on what ought to replace it, if anything at all. Thank you. Was it a supplementary on that? Just very quickly and briefly. I just wanted to go back to the points around insufficient evidence and repeatedly sort of mentioning time and resources. And I don't always know that it's through an awareness that there's insufficient evidence. I think sometimes given the way uh, the, the case management system is working behind the scenes. You know, fiscals have been given cases without the time to do the full due diligence and are just having to make the best of bad circumstances, which means you know, on occasions they don't have time to properly look at C CCTV uh, evidence. Uh, they're not having the chance to speak uh, to defence solicitors about defence evidence. They're not having the time uh, or the opportunity to speak to the police. Uh, about other evidence uh, or, or, or sort of information that they might have to contribute to that process. So I think there are definitely cases uh, off of what we've heard that are slipping through the net where through lack of time rather than a lack of skill, uh, fiscals are not able to consider all of the, the relevant points and deciding whether or not something goes to court. It's just lack of time to, to look at everything really. Yeah. Yeah to look at all the information that's presented to them. You, you drew an example there about information given to them by the police that or might be available that isn't in the report. I might question why that isn't in the report submitted to them. Then that might be due to other factors not immediately beyond that officer's control. I think it's also important to remember that the circumstances of cases change over the life of them. And what might have been the case... We are because we have had ev evidence from you today that prosecutors are going into court and they are not prepared because of the volume of cases they are being asked to take on there. And what Oliver Mandel is asking you, could that be one of the reasons that it hasn't been looked properly if there is a sufficiency of, of evidence? So just to make a time um, limit uh, target then is going ahead when it shouldn't. When we talked about preparation time, we were talking about preparation time in the context of preparation of a court for trial or for intermediate diets or other diets of court. What I understood the question to be here, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is around drawing from the Police Federation's evidence is about the initial decision taken to initiate proceedings and sufficiency of evidence at that stage, which is reliant on a police report and, yes, often is reliant on CCTV, which may or may not be available and may not be available because of factors beyond the police's control, because they may not have been able to seize that evidence or reformat it in a way that allows anyone to view it. So we work with the information we have at that stage, but what I can say and what my evidence is today is that on that evidence, Procurators Fiscal would not initiate proceedings if there wasn't a sufficiency. Do you recognise that there's just as severe a pressure on that process as there is at other stages of the trial, where you've got uh, Fiscals who are trying to juggle uh, multiple cases which are calling alongside uh, you know, the process of reviewing some of that and when you've got uh, police officers uh, and defence solicitors actively trying to phone fiscals and are unable to get hold of them uh, and we heard in another evidence session where they're often trying to go above their head and find someone else within uh, the organisation because uh, you know, the, the, the fiscals are coming back saying they don't have time to make those calls uh, or they're unable to track down uh, their superiors in the timeframes required. Is that, is that not a worry? I think 
I think it's correct to say that the experience of our members is that there are pressures at every stage in the prosecution process, and I wouldn't want to leave members in a uh, in any state of disillusionment in relation to that. It's quite clear that that is a position across the board. Um, that could lead to some cases where the evidence is insufficient <clears throat> just through sheer pressure and, and volume of cases. Is it not possible at least to conceive that there might on occasion be cases uh, that, that, that make it to court where the evidence isn't, uh, as it would seem when you've only got a few minutes perhaps to, to, to review that? There are cases where the circumstances change over time and new information comes to light. My experience is not the case that prosecutors are taking the wrong decision deliberately or negligently at the I end wouldn't of say the deliberately case. Or where we are, I think we're going to have to move on. Mary Fee, if it is very brief, then Fulton, then and I'm Mary. grateful, convener. Some of the evidence we heard before from prosecutors was that they were not allowed to use their discretion and there was almost a direction to prosecute. Is that a scenario that you're familiar with? I, I think it d perhaps depends on what particular si situation and circumstance you're talking about. D domestic violence or sexual abuse cases? Um, if, there is a, if, if on the face of a police report um, there is a, 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 a sufficiency of evidence, then our instructions are that we mark that for prosecution. And then, Marianne, could you keep your, your questions very, very tight, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll, thanks, I'll give it to uh, uh, just the one question. It's following on from points that, that others have made anyway, and uh, I suppose that's one of the, um, the things about um, coming in a wee bit later on. And it was um, <laughs> picking up on what Callum uh, had said earlier. I don't think there can be any doubt at all that, that this committee has heard uh, from a large number of stakeholders about the increase of uh, domestic violence cases in the court. However, that said, uh, I have to totally agree with Rachel and Fiona that that is what we would expect uh, in a modern day Scotland. I'm wondering particularly, uh, probably for Rachel and Fiona, um, to, to sort of keep the answers as, as brief as possible, um, what you would think about more robust um, diversions um, in terms of these particular offences and the, the, what the public would expect and, and, and possibly even looking at... Um, you know, programmes, rehabilitation programmes have been brought in at an earlier stage so that so that certain individuals aren't getting brought through the whole court process and witnesses aren't being brought through the court process at that early stage. I would completely agree. Um, I think that um, we know that the evidence uh, suggests that there are a number of um, diversion schemes um, that can be uh, very effective and have very good results in terms of uh, lowering rates of uh, reoffending. Um, I think I'm right in recalling that you may have some experience of criminal justice social work, um, and uh, my uh, impression is that uh, criminal justice social work is an area of the criminal justice system generally um, that. Um, uh, has suffered uh, in relation to um, uh, funding um, and uh, our members um, are, are willing and able to exercise uh, their, uh, their, their power and discretion to divert uh, cases reported to us um, for systems of, um, uh, of diversion. But that, that relies on um, adequate resourcing within any given locality to be able to do that effectively. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ben, then, Mary. Two, two very quick specific points. Um, in relation to the discussion earlier, Fonidia, about a capacity in, uh, with junior fiscals and, and trainees, I just wanted to, to clarify one point. It's my understanding that in, in, in recent years, uh, in the last three or four years, there has been that constraint around uh, second-year trainees being uh, at the forefront of the process, uh, as is necessary for their development, but, but perhaps overly, uh, overly so. But uh, there are then not being positions for permanent contracts thereafter. It's my understanding that now there are more permanent contracts available and that expertise is being uh, preserved and developed in, in, a, in, a, in a more advantageous way. And I'd just be interested uh, on your comment on that in terms of building capacity going forward. And just... Uh, very quickly, I, I, I noticed in, in your evidence, Gordon Crossan, about 
the, the reference to your concerns around any exit from the European Union, as this will undoubtedly decrease our capability to deal with cross-border policing investigations, such as the use of European arrest warrants and sharing of intelligence in a timious manner. I just wondered if you could comment further on that. It's just those two points, Convener. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I think I, I'd indicated earlier that we welcomed the uh, the, the recent uh, permanent recruitment uh, of legal staff. Um, our view, however, is that we simply don't have the necessary uh, resourcing, staff resource and resilience uh, for us to be able to um, provide the service that, that we would wish to provide. Um, I fully expect um, our senior management to come here and to give evidence um, and say that um, they can probably just about manage uh, to deliver the same service again with the same money uh, next year. Um, I have to say our position, um, and I make no criticism of, of that, I mean that's his job, um, is to um, manage the department within the budget that he's given. Um, however, uh, if, you, if, the, if the committee wants to see the sorts of improvements uh, that, that we've spoken about today um, and for the standard of service uh, that we, we would all wish to, to be able to deliver and the people of Scotland, I think, expect, um, our view is that actually additional resources um, are, are required. We spoke earlier about um, domestic abuse in particular um, and I, I note that our current budget includes an additional element uh, for uh, tackling domestic abuse cases. Um, my own view uh, is that um, that uh, additional element suggests that the resource would not otherwise be required, uh, and we reject that view. To, to, to just clarify that the, the fixed-term contract concerns are primarily around administrative staff, whereas there are, although there are still concerns around fixed term contracting amongst junior fiscals, there has been a development towards more permanent positions available. Is that, is that the, the position or is, is that not, not the case? are still recruited on fixed term contracts as well and we continue to have um, a concern about the use of fixed term contracts for any staff whether that be legal or administrative. Um, I think uh, a former Lord Advocate uh, previously said that you, you, you can't just uh, knit deputies um, and uh, I think that's true. There, there, we, we, need to, we need to recruit, we need to develop, we need to train um, the staff and you can only do that effectively if you have permanent members of staff and not temporary staff um, who, are, who, who may leave the organisation. And that, as I say, does apply to legal staff too. Thanks for clarifying that. I'm only going to ask Stuart Stevenson. I'm sorry, we're, we're going to have to, to uh, wind up. 12 o'clock deadline. Could you well, ask the question and the witnesses will give it in writing? I've already asked, with asked the question. Oh, sorry. Someone else wanted to come in. Yeah. If you're very, very brief. Well, um, Obviously, th thank you for the question. Um, as we can see in Scotland now, we welcome a lot of uh, foreign nationals here, and quite rightly so. That in itself brings its own challenges in relation to criminality. Um, so a lot of people that come here, we don't know what their backgrounds are. Um, by an exit from the European Union, um, that could um, significantly hamper our ability to deal with foreign nationals um, who deal in crime and also to share intelligence in relation to that. Um, if put it into perspective, there's a number of cases in Scotland just now that through that good working relationship we have through Europol and Eurojust, we've been able to bring people back to Scotland very, very quickly, which is a victim-focused uh, way of dealing with it. Um, if we don't have these mechanisms, and I can't underestimate um, the power of a European arrest warrant, if we don't have these mechanisms in place, then the delivery of justice will be significantly hampered across Scotland. Stuart Steen, can you give your question and a written response would be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, my, my question is your homework, and it's a deliberately naive question. Why, why do sheriffs allow course, uh, cases to be scheduled at all in advance of knowing that both sides of the case have indicated they're ready to proceed? in writing that would be appreciated that concludes our, our uh, questioning can I thank all the witnesses for what's been a, a very comprehensive um, evidence session and I now suspend to allow for a change of witnesses
I welcome our second panel of witnesses, um, comprised of Michael Meehan, a Law Reform Committee member, and Derek Ogg, QC, both from the Faculty of Advocates. Uh, the faculty has provided very helpful written evidence, and perhaps I could start off uh, by asking you about um, some concerns about the de-skilling of the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service as some senior prosecutors are diverted to maybe serious sexual abuse um, cases and homicide cases, perhaps to the detriment of other cases in the court, perhaps complex fraud ones. If you could comment, that would be very helpful. Uh, thank you, Convener, for inviting us uh, uh, to give evidence. Could I first of all um, uh, uh, disclose interest. Uh, I'm a former head, indeed was the first head of the National Sexual Crimes Unit in Crown Office and uh, finished in Crown Office in 2011 as the Assistant Principal Advocate Deputy. So I have experience on that side of the fence. Uh, uh, I'm currently also today the Chair of uh, Justice Scotland, although I don't appear on their behalf. Justice Scotland is the Scottish Division of Justice UK, a member of the International Commission of Jurists. So with that, with that declaration, um, you were asking convener about uh, de-skilling by specialising some people in advocate deputies in, in Crown Office. I suppose one of the starts of, of specialisation in Crown Office came with the National Sexual Crimes Unit for the very good reason that we wanted to be able to train a sort of cadre of people exclusively in uh, very sensitive investigation and prosecution in difficult cases. Um, so that we built up very quickly a level of expertise. People would be rotated out of NSCU, then into the general pool of uh, Crown Office, uh, Crown Council, Trial Council, uh, but they could be called upon at a later date to do criminal trials in rape cases. So we never allowed uh, um, any woman to be examined in chief by a prosecutor in a rape case who had not been specifically and expertly trained in that field. So even after they left our little nest and they'd flown away, we would still be able to go back to them because they were badged effectively uh, in, in that area. So I suppose for the best of intentions, um, we were creating a sort of specialist cadre, but we were feeding it back into uh, the system uh, again. Um, uh, I'm not sure de-skilling occurs a great deal at the advocate depute level. An advocate depute is a generalist by nature and, would, and should be expected to prosecute any crime that comes along, as any advocate who is defending should be expected to defend any type of crime that comes along. There is concern, though, by the faculty that there are specialist areas of crime that advocate deputes and prosecutors are not being trained in. And I think it's, it's a kind of standalone uh, uh, failing due to lack of time, lack of training resources, um, and that, that advocate deputies are not getting their in-service expertise, either updated or new expertise given to them. And I think it is fair to say, I think as the police have observed, there can be a disparity and perhaps a frustration where the police forces have very specialist, highly specialist units dealing with highly specialist crime, and they're not finding an appropriate uh, read across in Crown Office. That's helpful. Mr. Mead. Thank you, Convener. I, in terms of non-homicide and non-sexual uh, cases, which of course are specialist cases, uh, the uh, feedback from speaking with advocate deputies is that they have noticed a deterioration in the quality of cases that come to them to prepare for preliminary hearing stage. It had been envisaged that preliminary hearing would be the fine tuning, but there is more that needs to be done now compared to cases that came across their desks years ago. And one of the things that we've touched upon in the faculty response that echoes what's been said earlier to the committee is the lack of time to prepare cases. So there's now more work to be done, but advocate deputies are, fi are finding they're being taken away from primary hearing preparation to do other, other areas. Uh, PH preparation is so important because that is when the case is ready for trial. And if the time is not ring-fenced, there is a risk that cases which are coming to them in not as good a state as it would in previous years, they won't have the time to bring it up to the standard required. And does that inevitably lead to delays? 
I'm not sure that it does, because given the delay that there is in, in the, the court system, I, where trials are maybe fixed six or seven months down the line, then work could be identified to be done in the next month or two that would that would bring it up to, to speed. So what could be said to the preliminary hearing judge is that the case at this stage is not ready for a trial to be fixed. And had statutory time limits been met, that trial would be within a month's time. So we know, for example, the forensic report, the phone report, wouldn't be ready in a month's time. But if one is operating in the system where there's a six month delay, the fact that work is being instructed late doesn't matter. So advantage can be taken of the failure to meet the statutory time limits. Okay. John Finney. Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, gents. I I'd like to, to ask a question about the role of the prosecutor, presumably PF or ad advocate deputy, and particularly with regard to comments you've made um, uh, about discontinuing proceedings where you said this can be used to a number of factors, but a recurring theme is the blurring of the public interest with the perceived interest or expectations of the complainer. Now, from other sources, we've, se we've heard the, a, a suggestion that increasingly the prosecutor has been seen as the complainer's lawyer. Could you comment on that area and what the implications are, please? I think that's one of the concerns expressed, in fact, by the Dean of Faculty in an open letter to the Lord Advocate. And we've had a change of uh, office, of course. Um, I think there is simply a perception problem very often on the part of victims of crime that the prosecutor is their person in court. They're there to get justice for them. The prosecutor has a, a different role, however, and, and it isn't readily understood. And it might not even, if you put it out to referendum, be agreed by the public as the role the prosecutor should have. But it is, in fact, constitutionally correct. The prosecutor's job is to prosecute fairly in the public interest. And if evidence does not match up to the requirements of evidence by its quality or its reliability or its uh, quantity, so there's no uh, uh, substantial prospect of a conviction at all, the prosecutor isn't, isn't there to represent the, the victim to get the case limping into court under any circumstances. Uh, a judgment has to be made in the interest of justice to say, well, there is no public interest in prosecuting this further. The process of prosecution mustn't be a punishment in its own right. It, there should only be a punishment if a person is convicted following a fair prosecution. And prosecuting people, we mentioned these domestic abuse cases. Again, I have to beg to differ with the representative who made remarks about that. Um, I've had personal experience as counsel where I've been told by fiscals we simply have to uh, proceed with this. We're, we've been told we have to proceed with it. And they don't even bother now going to their senior. And that might be part of the culture. You don't go to your senior because you've seen that's causing a bit of trouble if you do, to say, oh, I just, this isn't going anywhere. But this real problem is in the failure to recognize complainers very often. And recognition, as you all know, is a process whereby the prosecutor engages recognition officers, not police officers to take a further statement and say, well, we know you gave a statement on the night in question, you said this. Now we've uh, heard from your next door neighbours uh, and we've got the CCTV camera when you left the grocery shop and things like that. What do you say about that? And of course the person may say, well, I don't remember that. Um, I was off my face on Valium or I had taken back faster or whatever that night or I'd been drinking champagne all evening. Um, and that would allow the prosecutor at that stage, had the precondition been taken, to make a judgment as to whether it is in the public interest. And indeed, sometimes to say to the complainer, do you really think this is a matter you wish to complain about, given what you've just told me about these other pieces of evidence we've now discovered? Uh, and the complainer may well be the first to say, do you know what, let's just forget this, it's, it's been a terrible mistake. Um, so the not taking of precognitions was a purely economic decision by Crown Office of, of complainers and other witnesses. That was a purely economic decision because, in, in my view, precognition officers were being moved on to the task of doing disclosure work, looking at whether matters should be disclosed or not and preparing disclosure documents in important cases. Um, so I think, I think that was, that's one of the difficulties. But there's definitely a perception uh, difficulty, and I think Crown Office needs to advertise more uh, freely to say we are not an, a complainer's 
solicitor. We are the public prosecutor. It's perhaps the issue of the terminology, because politicians like to talk about victims, victims' rights, and of course accused have rights too. So if we were to refer to, and, and I don't think the term alleged victim would be very popular, but complainer is the technical term. And it's the right term, given that we operate under a system of a presumption of innocence. So the person can only be a complainer. We call the indictment the libel, and we call it a libel for a reason, because it is a libel until it's proved to be true, because the presumption of innocence uh, exists. So complainer is good. Sometimes I, I've had complainers, and I've, I've spoken individually to them, and they've taken offence at it, because they think I'm just saying, you're just complaining, rather than you are the complainer about a crime. Um, but I think that terminology might sound a bit old-fashioned, but it's constitutionally uh, correct. One other brief question, if I may, thanks, uh, uh, Kavina. And, and it relates to, to the question of disclosure. And again, a, a very succinct phrase where your evidence says, it's hoped that a regime for early disclosure of evidence would obviate the need for consequent uh, delays. Disclosure still isn't working correctly, is that correct? That, 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 that is the feedback. There are still issues with disclosure, and one hears about situations in the course of a trial, matters being disclosed or, or, or being disclosed late, so that there does seem to be uh, continual feedback with regard to in disclosure not being as, a, as good as it could be, and I suppose in particular items being added by Section 67 notice. That's probably as good a way as any, certainly in some cases, to test uh, what is happening, because often those are items which, if they're being added to the court bundle late, have been disclosed late. It's not very often where something's been disclosed in good time and then there's been a delay in lodging as a production. So th there is an ongoing uh, feedback of an issue with disclosure. And just for the purposes of the record, I, I know it may seem self-apparent, but disclosure of evidence may indeed affect h how an accused would plead if it's done timely, with all the avoidance of the consequential process. Absolutely. Um, the requirement, the legal requirement on the Crown, and indeed the separate standalone requirement on the police to disclose, is to disclose matters which may undermine the Crown case or materially assist the defence case. We've discovered a lot of decisions on what to disclose are being made at recognition officer level. Let's bear in mind recognition officers are not legally qualified, and I think it is an enormous and a burden upon them to require them to make decisions of legal significance as whether something should be disclosed or not. I simply can't believe that fiscals have got the time, the recognition officer having done the exercise, to then look over the recognition officer's work to see if there have been full disclosure. And I can't think that advocate deputies have much time either when that case, in serious cases, goes up to Crown Office to look at it and say, well, has this been disclosed? Has that been disclosed? And I think it's all being dumped on the recognition officer at, at, at the low level uh, to do it. But it is critical, and it can result in cases coming to a complete stop when it's done properly, or it can result in people putting their hands up and saying, the game's up, and uh, we've exhausted every avenue. There's nothing there um, uh, for the defence. So... Uh, yeah, for, forgive me, I, I don't know where it is, and uh, I can't recall wh who's told this, but at some point it's been suggested that whilst there's a, a, a requirement to disclose statements, if the, the fiscal has sought further clarification from the police service and that exchange has taken place not by way of a further statement, but by an exchange of emails, there's no requirement to disclose that. Okay, thank you very much. And the requirement is on both parties, the police and the uh, fiscal. Thank you, that's helpful. Rona, then Douglas. Thank you, Convener. Um, you've highlighted the issue of readiness and uh, touched on the fact that prosecution shouldn't be a punishment in itself. But I just wonder, uh, from some of the other evidence that we've heard, whether uh, not just that there are cases that are being delayed uh, as a result of a lack of preparation, but whether there are cases coming forward for prosecution uh, where there's uh, insufficient evidence uh, or uh, you know, where uh, it probably wouldn't have gone to probably wouldn't have gone to court in the first place if the fiscal or uh, deputy had, had been fully aware of all of the facts. There's, there's no getting away from the fact that to master a case and to make a judgment on whether to prosecute a case or not, you need to master it. You have to sit down and spend some hours reading through page after page of sometimes pretty horrendous stuff. I can understand all the comments made about how stressful that, that job is. Um, 
but, but you have to read the evidence to get a flavour and to get a judgement for that second part of the test. Is there sufficient evidence as the first part? Is there enough corroborated evidence? The second part of the test, are, is there a realistic prospect of a conviction in this case? And also there is an overarching, is it in the public interest, to proceed with this uh, prosecution? Um, and there's no substitute for sitting down and reading the papers. And if you're not even going to preconose witnesses to get a deeper flavour drilled down a little bit into the statements made at the time, um, then I don't see how you're able to make effective judgments. Also, people that are overworked don't make good judgments anyway. And, and there's a tendency with the things, a bit like an arrow leaving a bow. Once a, someone's made a decision somewhere about it, no one wants to interfere with the decision. It just rattles on down the the track to ending up in court by accident sometimes, I think, yeah. rather than design. I mean, I think there, there, there may be a suggestion that um, because of political correctness or because of zero tolerance that prosecutors were deliberately putting unsupportable prosecutions into court just to punish the man, if you like, by having him experience the prosecution. I, I, I don't think so, but I think there is a culture um, which doesn't, doesn't allow for deep penetration of the case, discussion with the complainers, good recognition and good making of judgments. Uh, that's sort of not exactly the point I'm getting at. In the, you know, I, I don't think it's deliberate. I think that there are a number of people throughout the process who are under such considerable strain that, as, as you uh, have said yourself, don't have the time to even properly read through a case for the first time, who don't have time to personally review uh, all of the evidence and therefore they're effectively looking at something on face value and taking their best judgment call. But as part of making that judgment call, there's certainly a possibility, you know, in, in what then becomes a significant number of cases where they're taking the wrong punt effectively based on what they're seeing. And I just wonder whether that has a wider sort of ramification in terms of justice. I think I'd super add to what you've just said. I think all those considerations, if I'm respectful, say so are, are correct. But if you super add to that, the default position is generally to say prosecute, because then it becomes someone else's problem, rather than me having to explain as a prosecutor why I'm not, why I've made a decision not to prosecute. It's easier to say prosecute, and it'll, it'll make its appearance sometime in the future. Can I, can I tell you how it used to be done in Crown Office before National Sexual Crimes Unit? You know, there was a little piece of blue paper this size, and you'd read a rape, indictment uh, 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 folder, for example, and you'd put it closed, you'd put a paper clip on it with this blue piece of paper and write Pro HC Rape, and that's all the instruction it would be, Pro Proceed High Court Rape, because you wouldn't want to then do the next step if you decided it shouldn't be prosecuted, which is to do a lengthy note to the Lord Advocate or the Solicitor General for the personal approval of abandoning of prosecution, because you might be supported in that, but what happens if you're not? Now, if that's what senior advocate deputies were trepidatious about, imagine that filtered right down through the, the, the system. It, it, it becomes kind of like, a bit like defensive social work used to be, you know, that let's not make decisions which could be risky. The same kind of thing can infect Crown Office, I think, where people don't want to make decisions that are, are risky. It's easier just to prosecute, and as I've heard so many times, it's almost a cliche, let the sheriff throw it out. Not us. One just final question, just to clarify uh, for, the, for the record, do you think there's a, a definite presumption towards prosecution? You're clear that that's the culture that exists within uh, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service as a uh, whole? Uh, no, no, I wouldn't. Pr prosecution of all It's a presumption towards prosecution in, in general uh, when cases are being marked. The assumption for no. domestic, just general. Just a culture uh, just that there's a presumption towards uh, prosecuting in order to, uh, you know, avoid having to make a decision and uh, to pass no, it on. I, I wouldn't say that. I would say, in, in, I think sexual crime is such a, a, a hot potato, yeah. um, and it, it engages so many different of our stakeholders in this system. Um, I think that we've got to take that to one side. But I think, in general, uh, certainly at at Crown Office, if there's an insufficiency of evidence, that's it failed at the first fence. And unless we can instruct, we can say, well, look, we want you to go back. We send a note down to the fiscal. We want you to go back and look for more fingerprints or this kind of DNA or go abroad and see if they've got information on this guy. Um, we can make further inquiries. But um, 
If, if, if the case is half dead, then kill it. So you, you don't think there's a scenario in which where people are under time pressure and aren't looking at the, the case in sort of detail you were talking about before, where they say, you know, it's sort of, it's in the balance or it sort of leans towards uh, proceeding with prosecution. Do you think there's a sort of culture there where people would just say, prosecute, let the sheriff decide and sort of not take on that additional workload or so, think that's unfair? the Dean of Faculty, and I, I, I would agree with him, has expressed the view that that to some extent depends on the level of public interest in the case, the public profile the case has, the political interest there might be in the case, and as we've identified, the type of case it is, whether it's sexual offences or uh, domestic abuse, zero tolerance type uh, uh, cases. So if there are sensitivities about it, as I've indicated, I think the default, we've observed the default is to say, let the sheriff take it away, let the judge take it away and say there's insufficient evidence. Um, and in some cases, it's regarded as a win by some prosecutors if they get it to the jury. They feel, well, we've done our job, we got it to the jury. And it doesn't matter if the jury's out for five minutes and comes back 15 nil for, a, for an acquittal. They, we've heard from other people, yeah. they will let it go to court to decide rather than take the decision themselves in certain cases. And I understood the point, convener, that was being made by uh, uh, the, the Fiscals Union that um, they're not judge and jury. If you're a prosecutor, you're a prosecutor, you're not judge and jury. But you do have public interest considerations to take. It's, uh, a court is not a public inquiry, it's a court of prosecution. There's only one person going to jail if they're convicted, and that's the person sitting in the dock. And they have rights. And, for example, the prosecution, the careless prosecution of a rape case, for example, when I say careless, a lack of care being put into that decision making, damages not only the, the, the complainer, but has horrendous effects on a person who may well be innocent, who is being accused in his own community of being what any man would rather, he'd rather be called a murderer than a rapist, I would imagine. Stuart, what was your point, Nation? Just wanted Stop to ask me. a little question on the back of this. Whether you think things have changed in recent times in this regard. And I, I, I just say this, not to be too humorous about it, I happen to have been reading a rape case in the court papers from the 10th of November, 1830. And it sounds exactly like what you've said, because the prosecution deserted the case, because it was clear the preparation had not been properly done. There were precognitions, by the way, as there would have been in those days. So the question really is, how much has this changed, or has it always simply been a difficult area of public policy and a difficult area of prosecution? Um, Michael's most recently uh, been an advocate deputy as well as um, uh, representing the faculty's view. On, on, I thought on that I was going to say I've been about since the 1830s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get accused of that. <laughs> I, the, I think so far as the, the, the change, to, to strip it back slightly, I was a, a fiscal between 1990 and 1995. And at that time, as a fiscal, one would be involved in precognition. So you would have legally qualified people carrying out co precognition. My recollection is the, 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 the Renton Brown, which is the Bible for criminal practitioners, used to say, when precognition officers are, are employed, they will be under the direction of somebody who's legally qualified. So gradually there's been a shift from experienced solicitors carrying out precognition to no carrying out of, of precognition. So th th there has been a, a change uh, with, with regard to that. And the essence of precognition is it's a way of testing the Crown case at an early stage. And if one speaks to sheriffs or judges, they may say, the Crown are finding about their case for the first time. And if I can give, I still appear as an ad hoc advocate deputy, if I can give an example of a case that I prosecuted in High Court a few years ago, where I went to introduce myself to the complainer, just to say, I'll be the person who'll be wearing a wig in court, I'll be asking you questions. And it's a very superficial discussion because one cannot get into the evidence because if you do things start to be said, you'd have to re report to the defence. So you're really there to, to introduce. But one of the things which I'll say to witnesses who have not been recognised is, I'll be asking you to look at photographs of where you say you were raped. And in that case, the complainer was quite shocked. And she said, I'm glad you told me that, 
Because if they'd just been put to me in the courtroom, I'd have been uh, taken aback by that. And one of the real advantages of precognition is that witnesses in a room just with the fiscal or the precognition officer can look at the photographs and say, well, yes, that's where it happened. Because in presenting a persuasive crown case, if you have a witness who is reliving the ordeal, a jury are very likely to find that witness credible and reliable. So you're, you're, you're not wanting to add to their hardship at all, but you're wanting to find aids that will assist them in telling their story in a persuasive way. And the way to familiarise them with the aids and for the prosecutor to know how they will react is to preconise them to say, here are the photographs. Or, for example, saying, an hour after you left that location, you sent a text that, that, that may give the impression there was consensual intercourse. What do you say about that? So I think Sandra Brindley's evidence was that it, complainers are preconised, but certainly from my experience, that doesn't happen in every case. I can only speak anecdotally, but I do think the precognition added a real value. And because the Crown don't find out that, that what people will say about competing things, and to touch on what Derek said, as well as evidence that might perhaps undermine what a complainer says, a complainer might be able to say, actually, I can point you to evidence that will support what I say. And that's an advantage. But of course, once a trial starts, the prosecution cannot add new witnesses. So if a complainer was to say, for example, my sister, my neighbour can help on that, it's too late. The, the case is, is up and running. So I hope that, that ties us. I think the, the precognition really added value to the case and a good precognition, I would say, as a prosecutor, was worth its weight in gold because you would know what a, a witness may say about you know, medical records. I mean, for example, a witness may say to the police officer at the time, I had one drink, but then when they're seen by the, the, the doctor who's carrying out a medical examination, I had four glasses of wine. If you don't preconise that witness, you don't know how they'll explain the discrepancy. Whereas if you do, they'll say, actually... I was panicking when I spoke to the police officer, but when I spoke to the doctor, I composed myself, so that's why. So those are areas which can undermine the credibility and reliability of witnesses, but if they've got time, they can give you an answer. And the real advantage of the prosecutor, you know they have the answer. Because if you're going in blind, and you know the police statement says one glass of wine, the police surgeon says four glasses of wine, you're very uncomfortable about saying to the Crown witness, well, that's not what you told the doctor. So I, I think it's, it's a great shame that there's been a direction of travel in relatively recent times, because I'm going back to 1990, where the key witnesses were preconised that that's not happening. And without doubt, as Derek's pointed, that, that is bound to be a resourcing issue. Thank you. Uh, Rona, followed by Douglas. Yes, uh, thanks, convener. Um, in your submission, you, you talk about the fact that um, fiscals and deputies are often very hard to contact. And this is certainly something that we've, we've heard a lot during this inquiry. I just wondered what you thought, impacts you thought that had on the case and, and, and if you had any thoughts about how that could be improved. I had a uh, recent experience of this also as a, an, an ad, ad, ad hoc advocate deputy having his own office on a charge line. Mm -hmm. First, first of all, I may be jumping ahead of myself, the CJSM system is a concern. If I can give you an example, I was prosecuting a case relatively recently where I had a, an email that seemed to be copied into a cast of thousands saying that there's, there's an issue with, I think, the complainers saying that there's a, a change in requirement for special measures. And when I replied uh, to that, it, my, it was coming back to me saying invalid CGSM account. So people are sending me emails, but when I try and reply, it's not getting through because I'm told they don't, they don't have any, a, an email. So communicating by email is problematic. The, the, the premium line uh, it means you're having to contact people on a, on a, on a premium line. But there, there can be issues with regard to availability. One can receive papers, for example, and you see the case preparer is a particular person and you phone that number and they're on holiday and of course people are entitled to their holidays but 
I'm then having to go back to say, well, who else is dealing with it? Who else is dealing with it? And it does seem to me there'd be real value if one is taking a case to get a, a sheet of contact number saying, this is the direct dial number of the person who happens to be, to be carrying it. But one of the differences with the High Court in small numbers is that advocate deputies will often uh, speak to the Defence Council out with office hours. If I was dealing with a case with Derek, I, I would have no issue at all with Derek phoning me in the evening or emailing me or contacting me at the, at the weekend. Now, I appreciate that can be an intrusion into personal time and if, if there's concerns about, about stress levels, but sometimes that, that, that can be the only way because if people are in court till five, half past five, because although the court day maybe finishes at four, you often have to consult with your client or maybe go to the prison and see somebody else. So often there will be contact out with officers. So I think maybe that's an area that would require to be looked at that, that uh, how one can contact people out with office hours, uh, but clearly th there's issues with work-life balance and that can have an impact on people's welfare. It, 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 it sounds to me like a fairly easy fix in the sense of having an alternative contact list or, or just agreeing that you would be contacted out of hours, considering it's got such a, an impact. Um, and I'm just wondering why that's not happened. You know, as, 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 as if heads not been put together to say, let's, let's sort this. I think in the High Court, advocate deputies are, are comfortable with being contacted out with office hours. I'm not in a position to, 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 to speak uh, about fiscal. Sometimes you may have an email where they'll say, give me a call, but I, I think that doesn't happen to, to the same, same degree. There is, of course, the issue of if somebody contacts you, say, at seven o'clock in the evening, from a data protection point of view, do you have the papers with you? Because I don't, I don't think fiscals uh, will tend to take papers home. I think from the High Court, it's inevitable. You just have to work in papers in the evening, so you will have the paperwork available. So th there is confidentiality of information as well as the, the issue of, 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 of contact. There, there, is a, there is a big difference between the procurator fiscal practice in the local courts and the High Court practice, because generally, generally used to be advocate deputies were, were advocates and they'd be dealing with other advocates. And you'd, so you'd have the home phone numbers of each other and you would be speaking on a council to council basis, which confidential to confidential basis. Nowadays, some advocate, advocate deputies are less comfortable with a solicitor, an instructing solicitor, for example, having their number and phoning them up at home you know, um, any night. So uh, I think there are some, some perhaps old-fashioned apartheid issues there. Um, but as far as the fiscals are concerned, there's, there's no real ownership of the case until the night before anyway. So it's hardly, you know, you might speak to someone who is in the right department, but you might not be speaking to someone who is going to or is capable of or has got the time to do anything about what you're asking and certainly may not be the person conducting the trial. Okay, thank you. Douglas? start with uh, a similar question to, to Rona. Uh, I, I really can't believe it, and I, I said it at the time when our defence agents came to give evidence at the first session, that there are all these problems with the premium rate, nine, uh, premium rate line and information going missing. Um, you've given an example of the CSJ email address. But what do you, as the Faculty of Advocates, do to address that in terms of making your concerns known? Because the Glasgow Bar Association said they have very useful meetings with the PF service, eh, but this has been ongoing for five years. So presumably you're raising these concerns, but we're seeing no improvement. Eh, do you think that's acceptable? And what more can you be doing eh, as a Faculty of Advocates or others within the legal profession to just say this simply isn't working for you, for anyone in the justice system? Criminal Bar Association, which is the association within the Faculty of Advocates of uh, advocates who specialise in crime and have a special interest in crime, even if they don't uh, do a great number of trials, um, it, it will regularly um, uh, contact Crown Office to express concerns and difficulties. Uh, also, because the faculty is such a collegiate body, and remember our members supply prosecutors as well as defence counsels, so when we, we sit down together, we, we sit down as member of, of faculty. Um, no one in Crown Office can be under any illusion about these problems. Not a single person could be under, honestly, under any illusion about these problems. So it doesn't so require us to have a committee. So, so why isn't it improving then? Because um, we're using a clunky old English IT system on CGSM, and I take it the old double eight double four number is a moneymaker. Well, yeah, it, it 
probably is because people are saying it's, it's a premium rate line, but what we got from the defence solicitors was uh, similar to what you experience with uh, high court uh, dealings, that actually fiscals are saying, here's my mobile number, contact me directly. So I'm not sure how much that's been used anymore because everyone that we've spoken to says the phone line doesn't work, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Um, you're saying uh, information goes missing. We're now getting an example of an email that can come in, but you can't reply to it. I just can't believe anyone in the justice system, the legal system, um, maybe not accepts these problems, but doesn't do anything to resolve it. You know, we are living in 2016, where it shouldn't be the case, where everyone is highlighting these problems, but no one is willing to come forward with a solution. Well, someone from IT and Crown Office has to come up with a solution to provide a criminal justice server which is both secure, encrypted and works. And the way to stop the other problem with the 0844 number is to stop using it. Um, I don't think I'd like to be a young fiscal who's uh, knowing that I had about 40 or 50 or 60 solicitors in Glasgow having my mobile phone number wanting to phone me at night about cases I may or may not have. 40 or 50 a night, but yeah. what they were saying is they then get embarrassed when they go into court and are said, well, you know, the, yeah. you know this information has been requested from your office and they've got no idea of it. So it's, it's not that they, they think they're going to get plagued with all these phone calls. It's actually of a mutual benefit yeah. that they don't get embarrassed or told off uh, in court for not responding to these I things. I quite agree. Yeah. Um, but, but that's what I've asked everyone, you know, you're, you're putting up with this and you're not happy with it um, and you are seeing that our concerns shared uh, amongst the legal profession but we're just not at the stage yet that we can get over the next hurdle with a solution to these concerns. Um, I, think, I think there's a, a Scottish digital rollout um, committee or organisation which is talking about digital rollout and perhaps that, that might come up with something. But someone's going to have to write a cheque for an IT system that works. Yeah. Can, can I just... Oh, certainly raise stage. <laughs> One of the, di the difficulties that the defence uh, faces is that the Crown will insist that when any, do any documents are sent, they have to be sent through that system. So while representations can be made that it's, it's a system which we don't feel is fit for purpose, if the Crown say, well, if you want to communicate with us, that's what you have to do, then in until they put in place uh, an up-to-date system, then w w we don't have much choice in the matter. Could I also ask, uh, it's a, an issue that's been raised by a number of people uh, today and, and in your evidence and throughout this inquiry, um, but up until today the perception has been that uh, younger uh, fiscals, etc., with less experience, aren't willing to take decisions for fear of repercussions from further above. Yet in a letter from um, your uh, Dean of the Faculty, Gordon Jackson, to the new Lord Advocate following his appointment, he actually cited an example of um, quite a long-serving uh, advocate deputy who said she used to be a good decision maker, but has got so used to not taking difficult decisions, she's almost lost that skill. Could you maybe expand a bit more? I know we have had some discussion, but you know there was a perception, certainly from me, that this was just at the earlier stages of people's careers where they were worried about the repercussions, but now we're actually getting people saying they're losing that particular skill because even with a great deal of experience and quite a senior level, uh, they're not allowed to take these decisions. That, that may be because, and I, I think that's right, I think the Dean's right about that. It works at both ends of the experience spectrum. Uh, if you're junior, you're too scared to make a mistake. Uh, if you're senior, you're too scared at that level of seniority to make a mistake either. As I said, the default position, the easiest position for a decision maker to make is not to have to make a decision once someone else has commenced a prosecution. You simply push it on to its next, next base in the, in, in the, in the game. Um, so I think that people can get out of the way of making decisions. When I was in Crown Office, you were making on, on very serious child abuse, rape cases and so on, 20, 30 decisions about the future of that case that day um, and you just got used to it it's, it's, it's like going to the gym you know you just get used to the weight and, and you can up it um, but you can't uh, do that if you're not used to making that le trusted with making that level of decision and it's not maybe the, necessarily the fault of the decision maker but the fault of the person who is senior up in the in in the line we should be trusting our, our fiscals I happen to think we've got brilliant procurator fiscals in Scotland. I think they, I mean, 
I've had Americans over here from the FBI, from the Department of Justice and so on, and, and they can't believe how skilled and competent an amount of work that we, they, they get through that have never been a fiscal. I think, I think they're a, a real asset and they should be cherished, but that needs people also to have trust in their, their judgment. Now, they're, they're going to get it wrong, and that's when perhaps politicians need to understand that anyone in a, in a job uh, can make mistakes, particularly if they're under pressure and under stress. And as one, of, some, one person said, there's not always a right answer. Sometimes it's a judgment call. And as long as it's not outrageous and it rebels against you know, all public policy considerations and all good sense, I think it's good to see a Lord Advocate, as I, I think the new Lord Advocate will do, will loosen the reins somewhat. And I genuinely believe that of James Wolfe. James has recently worked in Crown Office as an AD. Indeed, when I was there, he was working there. But has also worked out of Crown Office as a, a, an advocate at, at, at the bar as well. And he brings that fresh mind to it. And he does tend to let to say, well, I, I have no reason to question this person's judgment. They hold a commission in my name as an advocate depute. So let them do what they're being paid to do, which is deputise for me and make a judgment. And in, in the olden times, and I think James will bring back the olden times, the Lord Advocate stood behind the judgment of the, the people lower down the line. There perhaps has been a, a, a corporate fear that that big uh, wig uh, backing isn't there all the time in sensitive cases. Say the, the committee has been very encouraged in any conversation we have had, and it has been um, not on record yet, but there is a real willingness with the uh, new Lord Advocate, the Crown Council, the Solicitor Gen and General to, to look at issues in the fiscal. So we very much hope the issues that we're raising here will um, go on to be addressed. Can I just ask you, um, before we close, I think expertise were looked at, certain crimes maybe not, not there in, in the fiscal service, um, with cybercrime, with um, some of the corporate crime. If the evidence fraud, perhaps, if the committee wanted to take evidence on that aspect, any suggestions on who you think would be competent to, to talk to us? Uh, one of one of the can I, can I just very briefly say one of the solutions to that absence of expertise is to do what the faculty um, and crown office used to do in its relationship, which is you borrow the expertise, you hire it from the faculty on a case by case basis. You don't have to get a top corporate regulatory crime person on the staff for three years. You could say for a certain football club limited case, um, we will get our particular. QC, who is an expert we know in the field of regulatory crime, he can come on and do that one case. So you can, you can buy it in and on a locum basis, I guess. But uh, Michael, I don't, I don't know if you know someone that could speak to it. One of the, one of the difficulties um, is that the, 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 the case that Derek has made a reference to is an ongoing case. That there, there's still a person being prosecuted in relation to that. I, so I, I'm loath to sort of say too much, but, but, so it's not so much, sorry, convener, a, a who to speak to, but when one can speak to, because once a case is closed, then people can say, well, what about this and what about that? But when a case is ongoing, it's, it's difficult to, to, to speak a, about that. But I think Derek's absolutely right that, that one way would be dealing with uh, bringing people by a case by case basis. But equally, I, I would have thought that the Lord Advocate uh, would want to have within Crown Office uh, some advocate deputies, and there's been a very recent appointment of uh, Martin Richardson, who's very experienced, is in the Supreme Court, who's been appointed. So I, I would think as, as time goes on, one may well see uh, the, the profile of advocate deputies uh, changing, so there are people with a commercial background. But, but Derek's absolutely right. It, it can't be the case that every single uh, case that there's somebody who would cover that, there's an opportunity to bring in people for, for a case-by-case -case basis. And just in closing convenience, the, the Lord Advocate has raised that in a recent letter to recruit people, asking if people might be interested in coming in on a shorter period. So instead of being a full-time commitment, uh, not quite an ad hoc, but an in-between stage, and I suppose that would allow that expertise to be considered. So that does look as if it's a line already being considered by the new Lord Advocate. 
very much. It only remains for me to, to thank you both for the insightful evidence that you've provided the committee with today. Um, we now move into private session. The next meeting of the committee will be on 22nd of November when we'll continue taking evidence in the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service Inquiry and we'll also consider a draft report on the Policing and Crime LCM. I suspend the meeting to allow the public and the official record report to leave the room. <laughs>